The subcommittee will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the subcommittee at any time. Without objection, members of the full committee not on this subcommittee are authorized to participate in today's hearing. Members are reminded to keep their video function on at all times, even when they are not recognized by the chair. Members are also reminded that they are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves and to mute themselves after they finish speaking. Consistent with the regulations accompanying House Resolution 965, staff will only mute members and witnesses as appropriate when not recognized to avoid inadvertent background noise. Members are reminded that all House rules relating to order and decorum apply to this remote hearing. This hearing is entitled Holding Financial Regulators Accountable for Diversity and Inclusion Perspectives from the Offices of Minority and Women Inclusion. I now recognize myself for four minutes to give an opening statement. Today's hearing focus is holding financial regulators accountable for diversity and inclusion, perspectives from the offices of minority and women inclusion. Our country is facing three pandemics, COVID-19 and the economic pandemic and the fight for social justice pandemic. These challenges have reshaped our work and our personal relationship in unprecedented ways. Today's hearing is totally virtual, and I appreciate all of our witnesses and members for participating by WebEx. I am hopeful we will be able to strike a balance between Amwe's historical context, the demand for greater industry inclusiveness and transparency, as well as highlight the accomplishment for Amwe performance. 2020 marks the 10th anniversary of the enactment of the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. Through the leadership of our chairwoman, Chairwoman Maxine Waters, members of the Democratic Caucus and countless diversity and inclusion stakeholders, Section 342 of Dodd-Frank was devised to serve as a catalyst to enhance diversity and inclusion performance at the financial regular, regulatory agency and for the entities they regulate. Prior to the enactment of Dodd-Frank, policymakers, financial services stakeholders lacked access to performance data to transparently review diversity practices and policies of regulated entities. And the financial crises of 2008 disproportionately impacted low-income Americans and communities of color. Congress, recognizing the important role diverse communities play in the United States economy, took action to diversify the financial service sector to help prevent the abusive and discriminatory practices that helped cause the crises from happening again. Throughout the 116th Congress, I, along with my colleagues, have reminded that all diversity and inclusion is a business imperative, improves the bottom line, and is essential an essential tool for closing the racial wealth gap. Our diversity and inclusion work has breathed new life into how financial institutions and the agencies evaluate, access, and expand inclusiveness. Dr. Broomer's recent analysis highlights a persistent lack of racial diversity in senior roles at the regulatory agencies. Our work has pointed to systemic racism and the need for us to be intentional in our inclusiveness, contrary to President Trump's comments. Systemic racism is a national crisis that impedes the full inclusion of diversity communities in our economy. In June, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell acknowledged structural discrimination exists in the United States economy today and impedes the economic success of communities of color. Mr. Powell also highlighted the Fed's requirement that asset managers and broker dealers who contract with the Fed in the pandemic relief effort must meet diversity and inclusion performance requirements. Just as we have charged the banks, 
and other financial institutions to discuss and share data regarding how they have improved the workplace and supplier diversity policies and practices, we are eager to hear from you regarding your agency's performance because transparency and e accountability are critical to achieving effective and sustainable performance. We recognize your limited authority and have informed each of the agency directors that it is them that this committee will be holding first in line for accountabilities on diversity and inclusion performance. In closing, we are resolute and determined to see your agencies and regulated entities achieve both the letter and spirit of Dodd-Frank, the success of our economy depends on the full inclusion of all communities. The chair now recognizes the ranking member, the gentlewoman from Missouri and my friend, Congresswoman Wagner for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. It's good to see you and, uh, and most of our committee here today. I appreciate your holding this hearing and I'd like to thank all the witnesses uh, for testifying today. We look forward to hearing from each of you on the work that the offices of minority and women inclusion have been doing to successfully diversify the workforces of our financial regulators. Over the past year, this sub subcommittee has held multiple hearings on the benefits of a diverse workforce. Studies show that companies with diverse workforces perform better compared to their less diverse competitors. Diverse firms prove to be more innovative than companies with less diversity. It is in a company's best interest to hire and develop a diverse workforce and create an inclusive work environment. Federal agencies like the private sector will realize many benefits from a diverse workforce. Diversity and inclusion while related are separate issues that must be addressed. Although a company or federal agency may be able to increase recruitment it is equally as important to focus efforts on making sure the environment is inclusive for retention to fully realize the benefits of a diverse workforce. Studies continue to show minorities and women tend to leave financial services firms at a higher rate than their white male counterparts. To improve the rate of retention, companies and federal agencies must adjust their culture and promote the development of diverse talent. This requires a pronounced commitment from leadership and a specific action plan to increase inclusion. In order to be most effective, company policy changes should be implemented from the top down and have buy-in at all levels of management. When I speak of top-down policy changes being implemented, a prime example is mentioned in Ms. Cofield's testimony. She meets regularly with acting Comptroller Brooks and the agency's executive committee and the senior management to ensure the OCC fulfills its commitment to diversity and inclusion. It's buy-in like this at the, at the senior level that makes a diverse, uh, that makes a big difference. Whether it's an OMWI director meeting regularly with an agency head and senior staff or a chief diversity officer having constant communication with the CEO, that relationship fosters a strong commitment to successfully recruit, retain, and promote minorities and women. The benefits of a diverse workforce are well established and the private sector has developed a set of best practices to recruit and retain a diverse workforce and prioritize inclusion. Federal agencies would also benefit from implementing these strategies. Some of the best practices we have learned about in hearings this Congress that increase retention rates and improve the inclusivity of a workplace include providing financial literacy training, transparency regarding salaries and promotion opportunities, mentoring and sponsorship programs, employee resource groups, unconscious bias training, and flexible work hours for working mothers. Our goal today should be to identify the successful strategies for recruiting and retaining minorities and women and explore how government agencies can better implement those strategies within their own structures. I look forward, Madam Chairwoman, to learning about the work that, that you all, the OMLIs, have been doing to today, and I'm proud of this committee for examining these important issues. 
I thank you and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Ranking Member. The chair now recognizes the chair of the full committee, the gentlewoman from California, the author of Dodd-Frank 342, Congresswoman Maxine Waters. Thank you very much, Chair Beatty. Just as we held banks accountable at a February hearing today, we have assembled the directors of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion, known as OMWIS, from the financial regulatory agencies to discuss their progress and challenges in fulfilling their diversity and inclusion oversight missions. 10 years ago, I authored the language in the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act. They created the OMWIS to be champions and watchdogs in our financial services agencies for diversity and inclusion. On the 10th anniversary of Dodd-Frank and with growing protests across the country, calling for an end to systemic racism. This hearing is long overdue. I wanna thank you and Ms. Wagner for the work that you have been doing, giving oversight to the always. Ms. Beatty, ever since you were elected to office, you have been taking on this responsibility. And I'm so appreciative to you for it. The financial services regulators play an important role in removing systemic racial and gender barriers and biases to ensure the American economy is inclusive and accessible to all. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Thank you. so much to our chairwoman. Today, we are welcome. We welcome the testimony of nine witnesses divided into two panels. Our first panel of AMWI directors will focus on the banking regulators. Regulators. Joyce Cofield is the Executive Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Office of the Comptroller and the Currency. Sheila Clark is the Director of the Office of Minority Women Inclusion of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Lacey Dingman is the Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Nikita Pearson is the Acting Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. And Monica Davey is the Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the National Credit Union Administration. Witnesses are reminded that their oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. A chime will go off at the end of your time, and I ask that you respect the members and other witnesses' time by wrapping up your oral testimony. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Cofield, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and members of the subcommittee. I am Joyce Cofield, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion at the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. I am pleased to discuss OCC's commitment to diversity and inclusion within our workplace, our suppliers, and the federal banking system. The OCC's OMWI was established in 2010 pursuant to Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act. I have served as the Executive Director since its inception. Acting Comptroller Brooks, our Executive Committee, and I share a commitment for promoting diversity and inclusion. I meet regularly with the Acting Comptroller as I have with previous Comptrollers. The OCC is dedicated to maintaining a diverse workforce through a strategy that focuses on leadership commitment, recruitment strategies that provide diverse slates, building employee competency pipelines, retention strategies sensitive to employee differences, and a culture that respects, values, and seeks diversity. As the subcommittee has explored in previous hearings, successful diversity and inclusion begins with the tone at the top. Acting Comptroller Brooks has vigorously campaigned champion his commitment towards improving the impact of OCC's diversity programs and has engaged the executive committee on how to improve the diversity of candidate slates for hiring and promotion decisions. Additionally, we are excited about a recently launched initiative, Project REACH, that convenes leaders from banking, civil rights, 
technology, and business organizations to execute projects that will reduce barriers to the full and fair economic participation and expand access to credit and capital to minority and underserved communities. To ensure that OCC hires and retains diverse management and staff, OMWI provides each business unit with detailed analysis of workforce trends twice a year to facilitate the integration of diversity and inclusion into business unit plans. These analyses include recruitment and hiring, promotions and separations, and employee development and retention information. To expand the diversity of our applicant pools, the OCC recruits at more than 200 colleges and universities, including Hispanic serving institutions, historically black colleges and universities, and institutions with large female student populations. We participate in minority professional organizations and actively support interns. This summer, we hosted more than 100 minority students from local high schools for a six weeks paid virtual leadership internship. Despite limitations from the coronavirus, the OCC provided the interns with many positive enriching experiences. The OCC provides a variety of education and developmental opportunities. OMWI supports these efforts by providing focused diversity and inclusion trainings, including unconscious bias courses for both managers and employees, and a course on women in leadership. The agency recently added LEAD, Leadership Exploration and Development Program, to build leadership competencies for aspiring leaders and managers. In the first cadre, completing this fall, there were 53% females, 18% Blacks, and 12% Hispanics. The OCC is also committed to the inclusion of minority and women-owned businesses at all levels of our business activities. I am proud that over the last 10 years, greater than 30% of all OCC procurement contracts have gone to minority and women-owned businesses. Working closely with our procurement colleagues, OMWI staff provide technical assistance, greater awareness, and facilitate matchmaking with potential contractors. And finally, OMWI's efforts, including collecting data from the diversity policies and practices of the banks we supervise. In 2015, we joined in the publication of a policy for joint standards. This policy statement provides a framework for banks to complete self-assessments, encourages disclosure to the OCC and to the public to increase awareness of the bank's commitment to diversity. To encourage banks to submit self-assessments, we have collaborated with the other agencies to sponsor outreach activities. This year, the banks will have until October to return their 2020 self-assessments. I thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I look forward to your answer. Thank you. Ms. Clark, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Thank you. Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the important role of the Office of Minority and Women in Inclusion at the Federal Reserve Board. The board is deeply committed to an inclusive workplace and a diverse workforce, as well as to fostering diversity in our own procurement practices and those at the institutions we regulate. Diverse perspectives inspire the best ideas, lead to the best decisions, and advance the Federal Reserve mission in service to the public. The board established its Office of Diversity and Inclusion in January 2011 to promote diversity and inclusion throughout the board, the system, and in the financial services industry. I work closely throughout the board and the system with the other Army directors at the 12 reserve banks, recognizing that the commitment of the board on these important issues is shared by the banks and their leadership. ODI administers and directs the board's Equal Employment Opportunity Compliance Policies and Programs and includes the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion. The board's OMWI, created pursuant to Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act, developed standards, procedures, and initiatives to ensure fair inclusion of minorities, women, 
and minority-owned and women-owned businesses in all activities of the board, as well as developing standards for assessing the diversity policies and practices of regulated entities. The board's army submits an annual report to the Congress outlining its activities, successes, and challenges. I will highlight key areas of this report. The board has made progress in increasing the level of diversity in senior leadership. In 2019, there were 19 appointments to the official staff, of which five were minorities and six were women. Currently, there are six female division directors, of which one is African American. Eight division directors are male, of which one is Hispanic. In addition, there are three African Americans, one Hispanic, and three females who serve as deputy directors in their prospective divisions. ODI staff engages with division leaders to measure progress against the board's diversity and inclusion standards, objectives, and actions. We will continue to address challenges with recruiting diverse candidates for major job functions, such as financial analysts and economists, and strengthening the pipeline to senior staff levels. The Federal Reserve System continues to focus on increasing racial and ethnic, gender, and sectorial diversity among reserve bank and branch directors. These boards function more effectively when they are constituted in a manner that encourages a variety of diverse perspectives. In 2020, approximately 75% of Class C directors, those who are appointed by the board to represent the public, and 70% of Class B directors, those elected by member banks to represent the public, are diverse in terms of race and ethnicity or gender. The board has made significant progress in the inclusion of minority-owned and women-owned businesses in the board's acquisition process. For example, 2019 contracts awarded to minority and women-owned businesses increased 9% over 2018. This was due in part to outreach engagements that focus on forging partnerships with minority and women-owned businesses and also creating a database of diverse suppliers and ensuring their capabilities to offer goods and services that meet the board's needs. In addition, with respect to the board's capital projects, we align minority and women-owned businesses with prime contractors for subcontracting opportunities. The board has engaged in a wide range of community outreach events to increase financial literacy and help students explore the field of economics. For example, we facilitate financial literacy activities aimed at minorities and women through the board's Federal Reserve Education Outreach Programs. Board staff economists will also participate in the American Economic Association Summer Program, which will be hosted by Howard University from 2021 to 2025. Additional details on the board's outreach is discussed in our annual report. We continue to strongly encourage the institutions we regulate to provide information on their diversity policy practices and self-assessments. In the last two years, regulated entities slightly increased their submissions. However, we are not satisfied with the level of responsiveness from these entities. We continue to explore ways to facilitate greater participation, including through engagements with our agency colleagues and the regulated entities. We appreciate the subcommittee's interest in our work and we look forward to working with you to continue to advance our shared objectives. I will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Ms. Dingman, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Thank you. Chair Beatty and Ranking Member Wagner, I am Lacey Dingman, Chief Human Resources Officer and OMWI Director at the New York Fed. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. Thank you for holding this hearing that marks a crucial anniversary of the ONWI provisions in the Dodd-Frank Act. And thank you for including the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Systemic racism exists, persists, and continues to hinder economic advancement for too many Americans. At the New York Fed, we believe that economic equality is a critical component for social justice and an inclusive and strong economy. I am proud and empowered to be an ONWI director at an institution that is dedicated to understanding and finding solutions to the inequality and inequity in our Federal Reserve District and the economy at large. OMWI represents more than a corner of our organizational chart. It is instead a commitment to advancing women and minority communities by all employees that is infused throughout the culture of inclusion at the New York Fed. 
Where do we start? We start with our people, the more than 3,000 exemplary employees of the New York Fed. As of 2019, our recruitment efforts provided us the opportunity to add 41% of new hires who were women and 50% of whom were minorities. We also recruited a diverse intern class, 58% of whom were minorities as well. We to strive for diversity in our board of directors, which as of 2019, consisted of 45% minorities and 33% females. And in our leadership team of executive vice presidents, which currently includes 36% minorities and 45% females. We know that the needs of women and minorities are better served when decision-making includes them at the table. And we will continue our efforts to exemplify a leadership team that is representative of the population we serve. Beyond our talented employee base, we work to increase the number of women and minority-owned firms that conduct business with the New York Fed. We have recently operationalized several of the facilities established by the Federal Reserve Board to support the U.S. economy in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Aided by trade groups like the National Association of Securities Professionals, we are working to diversify our business and vendor relationships under these facilities and also in open market operations that are unique to the New York Fed. I'm excited to tell you that later this week, we will be announcing new counterparty and agent relationships that will include minority, women, and veteran-owned firms. Finally, we deploy considerable resources of the New York Fed when it comes to identifying economic inequities suffered by women and communities of color, and just as important, identifying opportunities to bridge these gaps. I am so proud of the work that my research and community outreach colleagues have brought to bear on the disparate impact of COVID on minority communities. This work has only increased in dedication and fervor since the pandemic struck. We have helped identify and support the Federal Reserve System's responses to workforce development needs and challenges during this crisis. And we have convened community development practitioners across a variety of issues to support efforts to identify solutions for the most vulnerable communities. Reflecting and advancing our commitment to diversity and inclusion, later this month, the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation will air a segment on equitable economic recovery featuring our New York Fed President John Williams, Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, and your colleagues, Representatives Alma Adams, Emmanuel Cleaver, Gregory Meeks, and David Scott. What I've highlighted constitutes just a fraction of the progress the New York Fed, because of and inspired by the Amway provisions in Don Frank, has made in the area of women and minority inclusion over the past 10 years. While we can acknowledge our progress, we are not where we need to be. There is a long way to go. We are steadfast in our commitment to work for a more equitable economy and society for all, and will redouble our efforts in pursuit of this essential mission. I am confident and determined that we have been provided with the impetus and tools to make a difference for those we serve in the community and enhance the experience for all those who work at the New York Fed. Thank you for the opportunity to meet with you today. I welcome your questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Pearson, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Nikita Pearson, and two weeks ago, I became Acting Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion at the FDIC. Before I discuss this important work of this office, I would like to explain why this is not just another job for me. As a young black girl growing up in rural Georgia, I often went with my great aunt and uncle to their night job, cleaning banks. When I was older, I vividly remember going with my mother to one of those same banks and watching tears roll down her face as the loan officer disrespectfully denied her loan application. Even as a child, I knew what I was witnessing was wrong. The same bank that trusted my family with the keys to their bank would not lend to my mother or at least deny the loan with dignity. This is just one experience that came to mind when FDIC recruiters came to Savannah State University, a historically black university, and spoke to my accounting class about the mission of the FDIC. As an FDIC examiner, I would have the opportunity to influence policies that would help people like my mom. Now, as a 22-year veteran of the agency with 17 years in examination workforce, I understand the progress the FDIC has made on diversity inclusion, as well as the challenges we still face. Upon Chairman Mac Williams' arrival in 2018, she made her values and expectations clear. 
we will not tolerate discrimination. We will ensure the banking system we supervise is safe and inclusive, and we will recruit, retain, and advance a diverse workforce that is a reflection of the communities we serve. With these goals in mind, we have implemented several initiatives to advance diversity and inclusion in our workforce, our business activities, and the banks we regulate. While my written statement provides greater detail, there are several initiatives that we have recently taken that I would like to highlight. We have placed special emphasis on our largest group of employees, commissioned bank examiners, who make up about 50% of our workforce and occupy a significant number of leadership positions across the agency. To promote diversity at the FDIC, we must focus on our examiners. Our ability to attract and retain a diverse examiner workforce is affected by a number of factors. The amount of travel, our field office structure, and the impact of low turnover on prospects for career advancement. I have seen all of these challenges firsthand. The FDIC has taken steps to address all of these issues, reforming our examiner hiring and creating an executive level task force to improve diversity and inclusion. Mandatory examiner training is now more efficient and incorporates virtual learning. We have targeted recruiting outreach to minority serving institutions like HBCUs to build a more diverse pipeline. We are using technology to cut the amount of time examiners are on the road and away from their families. We are expanding mentoring and career development opportunities. We have improved workplace benefits by adding paid parental leave and a pilot student loan repayment program. These initiatives have proven successful. During the chairman's tenure, approximately 33% of our examiner hires have been minorities reversing a decades-long trend and exceeding our current representation rate. The agency has also increased diversity across management level positions, and Chairman McWilliams' senior leadership team is diverse. Beyond the workforce, we have also diversified our supply chain to provide opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses and law firms. In 2019, the FDIC awarded 31% of all new awards to minority and women-owned businesses and we paid nearly 11 million to minority and women-owned law firms. We have also promoted diversity and inclusion across the financial services industry. We are encouraging FDIC supervised banks to report on their diversity and have taken numerous steps to make it easier for banks to file their annual diversity reports. We are sharing our findings from the self-assessment on our website, and we have promoted best practices related to diversity and inclusion. The FDIC has made good progress in fostering diversity and inclusion in these and other areas, including support for minority depository institutions and efforts to promote financial inclusion. We also know that our work is far from complete. Chairman McWilliams is deeply committed to these efforts, and I am honored to serve the FDIC as her OMWI director at this critical time in history. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Davey, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, Chairwoman Waters, Ranking Member McHenry, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I am looking forward to sharing with you our efforts to ensure the NCUA remains an agency where diversity, equity, and inclusion, or often referred to as DEI, are part of who we are and how we do business. The Federal Credit Union Act designates the NCUA chairman as the spokesperson for the NCUA board and as the agency's representative in all official relations with other branches of government. I am here today in my official capacity as the NCUA's OMWI director to testify on agency's policy. Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act has been a catalyst for growth and change in the diversity, equity, and inclusion space at the NCUA. We are proud of the progress we've made over the last decade. However, this work takes long-term dedication and commitment. The NCUA is fortunate to have a succession of leaders who are passionate about DEI. Our current chairman and board members are not just individually committed to this work, but are collectively strong and unwavering in their support for these principles. 
Each of you has a copy of the 2019 Omni Report to Congress. Today, I would like to highlight just three key messages. First, the NCUA is committed to promoting diversity, equity, and inclusion within the credit union system. Second, the NCUA is taking concrete steps to improve key indicators of DEI within the credit union system. Third, the NCUA believes a diverse workforce, an inclusive work environment, and a diverse supply chain make good business sense, and we're equally committed to all three. Now on that first point about our commitment to promoting DEI within the credit union system, let me highlight just a few of the things that we've done. Last year, the NCUA hosted its first annual DEI summit. It was the first event of its kind for the industry and attracted more than 150 attendees. The summit's goals were to promote the value of DEI in credit unions, provide an opportunity for credit unions to share best practices, and offer attendees a forum to discuss solutions to challenges. Interest in DEI has significantly grown following the summit. In fact, afterwards, industry leaders came together with the NCUA to form the Credit Union DEI Collective. This collective now serves as a resource to the industry on all things related to DEI. On my second point, let me highlight some of the concrete steps we're taking to improve DEI metrics. Following that 2019 summit, we saw a significant increase in voluntary self-assessments submitted. Though we want those numbers to improve, we have shown steady increases every year, which is promising. To help ensure even greater participation, our board voted unanimously in July of this year to explore ways to incentivize participation. For example, the NCUA is considering the viability of reducing the operating fees charged to credit unions that submit their diversity self-assessments. We're surveying credit unions now on that idea, and we hope that Congress will support the agency in this effort. My final point, diversity and inclusion within the NCUA. Importantly, we're seeing improvements in diversity within our leadership pipeline. For example, over the past five years, racial and ethnic diversity in our management level staff, those in grades 13 through 15, has increased by more than five percentage points. During the same period, racial and ethnic diversity among our senior staff positions has increased by almost 12 percentage points. At the end of 2019, 20% of NCUA's workforce belong to one of our six employee resource groups, which support our diverse employees and create a strong sense of belonging within the agency. It's also worth noting that we are committed to continuous improvement with respect to supplier diversity. The agency awarded more than 40% of our total contract dollars to minority or women-owned businesses for the past two years. I will also note that our awards to minority-owned businesses has improved by 15.9 percentage points over the last five years. In closing, the NCUA is committed to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within the agency, the credit union system, and the broader financial services sector. I look forward to answering any questions you may have for me. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of our witnesses. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, first questions will go to Ms. Clark, Ms. Pearson, and then Ms. Davey and Ms. Cofield. Ms. Clark and Ms. Pearson, why do you believe your regulated entities have failed to submit self-assessment? Um, as we um, have been really providing an opportunity for the institutions to do just that, um, we find that in several instances at first, uh, institutions were not sure of what information they needed to submit. Um, but through the years, we have been able to clarify and work with them on those types of information that would be very uh, helpful and productive in addressing the issues within the financial services industry. Um, it has been slow, but we've seen even this year that out of the major financial institutions, more than 50% of them have submitted assessments this year, which have been significant in addressing 
um, some of the areas that we have been focusing on, like workforce, like the um, supplier diversity or procurement processes. Okay, thank, thank you. I'm going to go to Ms. Pearson. I have several questions, so uh, I hate to cut people off because okay. I'm really enjoying I'm your sorry. answer, Ms. Pearson. <laughs> and then Ms. Davey and Ms. Cofield, uh, you have had the highest level of responses to the self-assessment request, but fell short of the goal. Should these assessment processes be mandatory for regulated entities? Ms. Davey, Ms. Cofield, do you want to take that last and then we'll come back to you, Ms. Pearson? We're on, we're on a timer. Are, are you with me, Ms. Davey? Well, Ms. Cofield? Ms. Hi, thank you so much for the question. So um, the NCUA would be willing to consider and provide uh, administrative assistance to Congress if they in fact make the self-assessments mandatory. Right now, our agency has taken the position, our general counsel's office, that they are not mandatory. Okay, anyone else wanna comment on that? Okay, let me go to uh, the next question. Business diversity is a top priority uh, for me. Ms. Dingman, can you briefly provide an update on your business diversity efforts? Yes, thank you for that question, Chair Beatty. We have been um, working extensively to build more relationships with the minority women and veteran businesses community, especially within the second district. Um, as I mentioned in my oral statement, one of the things that we're most proud of is the recent work that we've done with the National Association of Securities Professionals. And later this week, we will be announcing um, additional counterparty relationships as well as vendor relationships with minority women and veteran businesses. Um, this is an ongoing effort and one that we have to continue to go after because we realize how important it is as a business imperative. Thank you. To uh, all of the witnesses, are you familiar with the letter that came from the OMB director, Russell Vault, uh, where they made, he made reference in, to this letter? And I don't know if uh, you can see it, but uh, I would like to enter it to the record and without objection, I will allow it to be in the record. Uh, do you believe in any way through any of your training for diversity and inclusion that you have stated or believe that all white people contribute to racism or benefit from racism, as he had said in this letter, where they are asking for us to stop uh, all training? And, and that can be a yes or no. And we'll just go right down the panel. Ms. Clark, Ms. Pearson, Ms. Davey, you know who you are. It's yes or no, please. This is Joyce Cofield. Uh, we absolutely do not have training that in any way contributes to divisive language like that. Thank you, Ms. Cofield. Uh, Ms. Uh, Pearson, Ms. Davey, Ms. Cofield, uh -huh. from Joyce Cofield. Anyone yeah, else who I assume you do do it? No, this, is, um, this is Ms. Clark. Um, I would say at the Federal Reserve, we in no way um, have any training that precludes that all white people are Thank you. Um, Ms. Dangman. Ms. Dangman. At the Federal Reserve Board, no, we do not have um, divisive language in our training. Okay. Anyone else? Yes or no? That is Nikita Pearson right. with the FDIC. Our training does not include yeah. that. Our purpose in our training is to educate and not alienate anyone. And Thank you so much. And my time is up and, and I yield back. Uh, I will now go to our ranking member, Congresswoman Wagner, for five minutes of question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, Ms. Cofield, you've served as executive director of the OCC's Envoy since the office was established in 2010. I'd love to hear from you what have been the most significant challenges that you and your office have faced with respect to recruiting and retaining women and minorities. Ms. Cofield. Thank you. Um, similar to the FDIC statements earlier, uh, examiners are our largest population in the OCC and maintaining a, a firm pipeline of diverse 
candidates and diverse employees within our examiner ranks is our biggest challenge. From the standpoint of examiner examination, it really is a very long training time period and becomes, I think, distracting to new people as they think about a career. So we spent a lot of time in terms of marketing the examiner role at OCC and the kinds of things, the kinds of work that gets involved in it. But it becomes difficult, I think, for, based on travel and based on the amount of time that um, needs to be invested into doing that job, that others can see themselves in that role. In addition, the training time period is very long. It takes five years at OCC to get to commissionship. So you have to really build an incentive around what's possible in this career. So that's been our most challenging piece. And, and, and let me just ask you, um, wow, five years. I mean, how, how do you address those, those challenges and uh, are there any new challenges that you're facing right now? So, so we've been trying to pay attention to this uh, a lot over the years. One of the areas that helps us a lot is our employee network groups that offer up opportunities for their constituents to not only get support relative to being knowledgeable of where opportunities and um, uh, both promotions and, and new job opportunities as well as basic developmental opportunities within the organization, but they act as support structures relative to mentoring and coaching each other and keeping each other informed in terms of uh, activities in the, in the agency that would be important to them in their careers. They do mock interviews, for example, with each other to support uh -huh. each other. Let me ask you this. I know that um, in July, Ms. Cofield, Acting Comptroller Brooks announced Project REACH with the goal of expanding financial access to by reducing the number of people excluded from the mainstream banking system due to their credit score. Uh, access to America's Main Street banking system is very, very important to me with millions of Americans still unbanked and underbanked. How will Project REACH specifically help them? So, we are focusing on convening players here relative to the banking world, the um, leadership relative to civil rights and our community activist groups, technology organizations, businesses sort of generally, in terms of looking at uh, trying to identify the barriers that get in play relative to fair, full participation in our economy. So, and, and again, the major piece here is this is focusing around resolution. It's looking at three to nine, three months to uh, six months kinds of activities that can be uh, organized to make a difference relative to that process. So again, the main Thank issue is it's not philanthropic, it's really resolution oriented. Thank you. And Ms. Dingman, in your testimony, you mentioned the New York Fed's 10 resource networks. Are these similar to an employee resource group? And could you explain the differences in these 10 resource networks and how they're proving to be effective at increasing the rate of, of retention for women and minorities within the New York Fed, please? Ms. Dingman. Thank you so much for that question, Representative Wagner. The employee resource networks are, yes, very much the same as what you would expect in the federal space. Um, we have 10 of them, as you highlight. They have been um, active so much so that we have 1,500 um, employees who participate. That's over half of our organization. And they help That's bring great. about a variety of programs. Um, last year alone, we had over 50 programs that helped with building um, inclusion within the organization, also spotlighted a series of issues that were affecting those particular communities. So we see them as integral to our business. That's, uh, that's, that's terrific. I, I have to tell you that uh, I think these 10 resource networks are something that uh, we're seeing both in the private and certainly in, in our federal uh, financial regulators system and is something that's uh, very positive. So I have run out of time and uh, I, I, I thank you all again for your, uh, uh, your interest and testimony today. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Madam Ranking. Uh, the chair now recognizes the distinguished chairwoman of the Financial Services Committee from California, Congresswoman and Chairwoman Maxine Waters. Thank you very much, Ms. Beatty. Uh, I'd like to direct my first question uh, to Ms. Pearson. I think she's with the FDIC. Uh, <clears throat> when you give us uh, the stats 
on uh, <clears throat> your improvement, for example, in the hiring of uh, <clears throat> minorities and women. I'd like to know, can you break that down to tell us how many African Americans, how many Asians, how many Latinx, how, how do you, do you break that down and could you tell us that if we ask that information? if we sought that information from you? So, so the short answer is yes, we do break that down and we can get that information. I do not have all the details here with me as far as the new hiring. I do have that 33% have been minorities. And if you look at our total workforce today, 30% of our workforce is our minorities. And that's about a we have increased that representation rate. I'm and then, excuse me, I'm interested uh, in knowing uh, exactly how many African Americans, how many Asians, all of those in the protected classes. I yes. like to break down. Do you have that information? I have some of that here with me, and I'll be happy to get the rest with you. So there is 17% Black of our workforce. There are 4% Latinx and 45% women. And some of the other groups, I'll be happy to make sure that we get that information to you, Congresswoman. Thank you. And when you speak about uh, women, uh, do you have a breakdown of the protected classes among uh, that group, women? I do not have that with me, but I will be happy to make sure we get that to you. Thank you very much. Um, I guess while I have you, I want to ask you about um, another aspect of Omri's. I'm very appreciative for the information on hiring. I haven't heard a lot of information about contracting. Perhaps I'll go to the Fed. Uh, I think that would be uh, Ms. Clark. Ms. Clark, uh, can you give me an example of the kind of contracts that have gone to minorities and women? Um, thank you, uh, Councilman Chair Waters. Um, various contracts have gone to uh, minority and women-owned businesses. Right now, the majority of our contracts are in capital projects, and so we have done a robust outreach to encourage uh, minority-owned businesses, particularly to um, have meetings and connect with prime contractors around the capital projects that we currently have. We have major contracts on the professional side um, of services that we um, are acquiring. Uh, and in that regard, most of the contractors are minority and women-owned businesses. I'd like, to engaging in that business. I'd, like to, I'd like to get a breakdown and an identification of the kinds of contracts uh, that um, you have been able to assist uh, at the Fed. I just have no idea whether, again, you are referring to your capital uh, possibilities, your contracts there, but I'd like to know uh, all of the areas in which you have minorities that are getting contracts, and you can get that information to us later on. Back yes, I'd be happy to provide that. I have my time expired? No? No, okay. you're, you're good, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Back to the FDIC. Uh, I've always been concerned about what happens um, with uh, our small banks in particular. It seems to me uh, that there have been increasingly over the years a number of small banks that have failed uh, and they have been taken over uh, by the FDIC. Have any of those banks been acquired by minorities FDIC? Ms. Pearson. So I do not have the breakdown of the specific acquisition information, but what I can tell you is that if there is a small institution, um, particularly if it's a minority depository institution, that we first, based on our policy statement, seek to find um, bidders who are also minority depository institutions before we open it up to the bigger process. Have you been successful in any acquisitions uh, by minorities of failed banks? Uh, when you're putting them back on the market? Yes, we have been successful, and I'll be happy to get you the details if you would like them. Uh, thank you very much. I would appreciate that. And if I still have time, uh, to Ms. Cofield, controller of the currency, can you give me some information about contracting? What kind of contracts have you been able uh, to assist minorities with? Sorry. 
across the board generally, but, but, but very high relative to IT. Relative to 60% of our contracting business is in the IT arena, and we've been very successful with minority contractors in that NACE code. Thank you very much, and I'd like to get that information from you uh, to help understand uh, exactly uh, what businesses have been successful and what we can do to do outreach to other businesses who perhaps would be eligible for other kinds of contracts who may not be responding to requests for proposal uh, in any way. So with that, I yield back the balance of my time, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Oklahoma, Congressman Lucas, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing today on how we can achieve a more diverse workforce in the banking and financial services sector. One of the big challenges, if not the most major challenge in the financial services industry, is finding diverse, qualified applicants. So I'd like to put this question to the entire panel. What financial literacy and education initiatives are your respective organizations involved in to illustrate to students the potential careers in the financial sector so that they can prepare themselves for the opportunities that exist? Uh, and I asked the whole panel that question. So this is Joyce Cofield at the OCC. Um, we became very clear that preparing students even at the college level was difficult in terms of starting to embed financial literacy information. So several, two years ago now, we began a internship program in our local high schools here in the city of Washington. Um, that program is in the second year this year. We had 100 students that participated in that. And part of that experience is specifically oriented around financial literacy. Anyone else? This is Sheila Clark from the Federal Reserve Board. Um, we have several programs that are uh, geared to um, encouraging and educating and providing information on the kind of jobs that we've had. We work very closely with um, a lot of the HBCUs, the Hispanic serving institutions. We also uh, participate in an initiative that was uh, started in Chicago, uh, which is called the Pipeline Initiative, which is done with major banking and finance service companies to um, basically establish relationships through mentoring and coaching for college students who are interested in finance and bringing them into the organizations to um, do rotation assignments, to do uh, also uh, some internships. And we monitor that very closely and we stay engaged with those students. We participate in the uh, American Economics Association summer program, which uh, I mentioned previously, uh, in order to not only encourage students to stay in the economic field, but also to provide them support in advancing their education. This is Monica Davey with the uh, National Credit Union Administration. Uh, like the other agencies have mentioned, we have three different types of intern programs. One is the high school program that we participated in with OCC this year. We also have a pathways intern program, as well as a contract intern program that focuses on uh, bringing in minorities into the agency. With all of those interns that come in, we are sure to make sure that we provide financial inclusion as part of their education. We also have on our website, uh, my uh, credit union provides a, a ton of financial inclusion education uh, geared specifically to, to children. Also, we participate with the African American Credit Union Coalition at their uh, conference every year where they actually have a financial inclusion fair where students are brought through, given jobs, given a budget, and they actually learn how to spend uh, money on different things like paying bills. Thank you. Representative Lucas, this is Lacey Dingman from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. In addition to the internship programs that many of my colleagues have mentioned, we also have a robust financial literacy program that our communications and outreach team does. And last year we reached thousands of, of 
um, students as well as educators through our economic pedagogy program, as well as through our comic book series. And we find financial literacy, literacy is very important to the second, second district here in New York. Congressman Lucas, I, I want to thank you very much for tying those two together, so recruitment and financial literacy. I remember when I started at Savannah State University, walk, walking down the commons area, and the first thing I see is a bunch of different credit card companies trying to reel me in. And so when our recruiters go to, to the different universities, the one thing we do in a purposeful and intentional effort that we don't just tell them about the jobs we have. We talk about our services. We have resume writing. We talk about financial literacy. And we really make sure that we prepare. We do mock interviews. We prepare the students so that they can be successful when they compete. The reason I bring that up is, of course, as we create opportunities for people to live up to their potential, they have to know that those opportunities exist. And that's why these programs are so critical. And with that, Madam Chairman, my time has expired and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now it is my honor to go to the distinguished gentleman from Missouri, Congressman Clay. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Let me also uh, thank you and my friend and neighbor, a ranking member Wagner for uh, conducting this hearing today. I think it's so important that we I examine this sub the subject and you know Dr. Chris Brummer's recent report entitled what do the data reveal about the absence of black financial regulators found a critical lack of black people among appointees and senior policy uh, staff at the financial regulatory agencies according to the analysis only 10 of 375, 79 appointees have been black. Only five of 120 total senior policy staff positions are currently held by African Americans at the agency. The report concluded that when black people are excluded from these high posts in the financial regulatory agency, a black voices are muted and do not have a say in the outcomes that affect their ability to be fully included in the economy. Uh, this, these two questions are to all panelists. Um, with a lack of diversity in these senior levels, what else do OMWIs do to ensure that minority communities are not overlooked when your agencies consider new rules and regulations? And what measures do your offices take to review diversity within promoting and hiring senior staff. So two questions. Um, what else do you all do? And then how do you all impact hiring and promoting of senior staff? We can start with Ms. Davy and go down the line. Sure, thank you so much for that question. Let me first say that we are proud uh, at the NCUA to have Chairman Hood who is the first African-American uh, head of a banking uh, regulatory agency. And he is extremely committed to making sure that we examine our processes, our policies, our systems to remove any barriers that, is, that exist for African-Americans to proceed uh, through the career pipeline. We are extremely committed to making sure that we have mentoring any employee at NCUA who asks for a mentor, no matter what their grade is, we are sure to make sure that that employee has a mentor. We are looking at our examiner series because, again, 67% of our workforce are examiners. So if uh, African Americans or any other minority group of women are not proceeding through that career pipeline, then we're not going to achieve the diversity results that we want. So within the past two years, we've worked with OPM to really look at our examiner series and look at how employees are able to process through. We've looked at the exam that examiners have to take to go from grade 11 to grade 12 to make sure that if there are any barriers there that are not completely visible to us, that we remove them and address them. Uh, and I am proud of that work that we've done. We thank also you. just okay, make sure. Okay, Ms. Thank Davey, you. let me touch right. you down so I can get to the rest of the panel. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, Ms. Pearson, uh, how do we overcome the challenges of hiring uh, and promoting? Some of the things we've been doing at the FDIC, we first engaged a hiring manager and we have frank conversations about what the needs are 
And then Amway, along with our HR office, we also partner with how we advertise. When we go out to recruiting events, we don't just talk about um, marketing entry-level positions. We also now talk about our higher-level positions that will be available. In addition to that, we're in the um, process of editing our merit promotion process. Uh, and so with that policy, Amway is involved in looking in that with that policy to make sure we don't put any unintended barriers into place. We also have some new corporate-wide succession planning that we're working on. We have a new um, leadership development program where we identify high-performing people to pull them into that program. We also have a special assistant program where individuals who may not have had an opportunity to work with chairman of office level folks, that they have that exposure and that awareness. And then we're also taking the time to look at our processes, evaluate it, and identify and eliminate any barriers that we have. And that way we can make sure that our senior leadership team is diverse and inclusive and represents the communities that we serve. Thank you, Ms. Pearson. Ms. Dingman, can you weigh in on the question? So, like my colleagues, we also have very similar processes in place. We also utilize uh, seven different search firms who are have diversity um, outreach efforts, and uh, many of them are minority and women veteran businesses. Um, in addition, we also ensure that through our um, recruitment efforts, we make sure that throughout each part of the process, we remove as much unconscious bias as possible through a rigorous set of processes and programs that we have. And overall, I feel like we are um, very much doing our part to try and raise the awareness so that hiring managers are thinking about diverse candidates throughout the entire process. Thank you Thank for you, your response. Time up. My time is up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. The chairwoman now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Gonzalez, for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Beatty. Uh, good to see you as always, and thank you everybody for, for being here today uh, <clears throat> for this important hearing. Uh, Ms. Pearson, I, I wanna start with you uh, for a couple questions. I, I was struck by your personal story, so for a little bit of background on me. Before uh, I did this job, I, I was a professional football player in a prior life, uh, and, and you sort of described growing up poor in the South, black woman, uh, and, and how difficult that journey uh, can be, but uh, you talk about how you know, your work experience has really helped you um, sort of in, in not just professionally, but but um, in terms of you know, sort of overcoming many of these barriers. When you describe that, it it, um, it resonates with me because you, you sort of describe a lot of my teammates. Uh, now they were men, but, um, but uh, you know, similar growing up poor, black and, and in the South. Um, my question is, and maybe this is beyond the scope of this committee even, but you know, how do we get more people to travel the distance that you did, the professional distance, right? To go from very difficult circumstances to where we can overcome barriers and, and really, um, you know, just power through some of these incredibly difficult obstacles that, that we have in our society today. I'd love to just hear your perspective on that. Thank you. So the, the first thing is to be purposeful and intentional. Um, there are more Nikitas out there in the world, probably a lot better than I am. So be purposeful and attention. Go to the historically black colleges, go to other minority serving institutions and recruit them and help them be prepared to be successful. Once you get these individuals on board, like myself, make us feel included. And when I say make us feel included, that we have opportunities, that we have opportunities to engage as far as like with employee resource groups, no matter where you're particularly located. The FDIC, I've been in our mentoring program. I was in our executive potential program. The FDIC paid for graduate school of banking. I went to Harvard for the senior managers of governance. So really, really having that career development. Um, I had both formal and informal mentors at the FDIC. So, and then there were a number of different career paths for where I wanted to take. So not only was there recruitment, where the my recruiters who recruited me from Savannah State, they didn't just stop once I came on board. They called me regularly. They checked in on me to see how I was doing. When I got on the job, I had a coach assigned to me that helped me with my commissioning process. I had career development opportunities. And then they gave me the opportunity to do like the work that I'm doing now. 
I go back to Savannah State University when I can to do recruiting and to identify others and, and share my different perspective that may be valuable in saying, this may look like that to you, but that is a rising star right there. And I can see it because I was that person. That's really powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, again, question with you. One one of the issues we encountered throughout the pandemic and continue to is, is getting capital into the hands of small businesses, in particular minority-owned small businesses. Uh, can you share your perspective on how minority-owned businesses were able to access capital from financial institutions and, and also what we could have done better? So I'm trying to just understand, you know, we made some progress, but, but what did the, the stars do and, and how can we sort of pass those learnings on to the rest of the financial community? And, and so, Congress, I just want to make sure that I get your question. Your question is more so focused on getting hands into the capital, getting capital into the hands of small businesses, minority yes, owned businesses. Minority owned small businesses, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay. So, one of the first things is developing a, a relationship. Um, so, when relationships going in, getting to know your banker, the FDIC, we not only have a community bank advisory committee, we established a minority depository institution subcommittee. And the reason that I bring that up is because minority depository institutions serve their communities, not just with the big loans, but they are probably the biggest lender or one of the big lenders for small business loans and minority owned communities. They know their communities. And so our support has been, how can we work more closely with institutions like minority depository institutions to help serve their communities? Great. I see I only have 20 seconds, so I'll yield back. But thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Ms. Pearson, for your responses. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Texas and the chairman of Oversight and Investigation, Congressman Green. Is Congressman Green seated? I am seated and unmuted. <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you, you Congressman. <laughs> uh, thank you for hosting the hearing today and the ranking member as well. Uh, especially want to thank the chairperson of the full committee. And I do this because without question, reservation hesitation, I, I have to say this hearing is long overdue, and, and it, but it's timely. It's timely in the sense that on September 5th, I have intelligence indicating that President Trump has, de -banned, has banned diversity training, and he seems to be calling it anti-American. Seems to be saying that such training uh, only fosters resentment in the workplace. This is pretty strong language, uh, given that we know the role of the AMWIs is to create forums where employees can have honest, candid, courageous, uh, and safe conversations about the impacts of invidious discrimination in their personal and their work experiences. Uh, this causes me a good deal of concern. So let me just ask you, uh, Ms. Pearson, to quickly tell me, uh, do you provide such training at your agency? And uh, can you just give me some indication as to what the benefits of these training, this training is as it relates to your staff? So we do provide training on diversity and inclusion. And our purpose, like I said earlier, our purpose in our training is to educate and not alienate. We have to meet people where they are. People bring different views and perspective. And when we meet together where we are, then we move forward and we move forward together. That means that sometimes the conversations are a little uncomfortable, but we learn and we grow and we move forward. And the feedback that we've received from employees is that they appreciate the training that we have. They appreciate the opportunity to share their stories. Other folks appreciate the opportunity to hear different perspectives. And we all feel that this is a good thing for us. Now, let me just quickly talk to all of the members of the panel, because uh, ordinarily, I would simply have you raise your hands, but uh, given the environment we're in, let me ask you, Ms. Cofield, quickly, do you believe that um, this is the American thing to do, that uh, this kind of training is uh, appropriate for your workplace? Can you give me a simple yes or no? I think it's quite appropriate, yes. 
Okay, Ms. Clark. Yes, I also feel that is quite appropriate. Ms. Dingman. Yes, I agree as well. Uh, Ms. Davey. Yes, I agree as well. Okay, uh, I also would want to call this to the attention of my colleagues. Uh, this is evidence of why we need HR 8160, the bill that is styled promoting diversity and inclusion in banking. Uh, this is important because we have evidence now that a president will do what he can to thwart the efforts of the Amwis, uh, something that has been the law for many years now, Dodd-Frank uh, brought it into being under the leadership of the Honorable Maxine Waters. Uh, this kind of effort to thwart what we are trying to do, which is constitutional, which is American, should not be allowed. And this bill would actually require the regulators to examine financial inclusions, uh, inclusion and diversity and inclusion, I should say. So I'm, I'm actually uh, saddened by what the president has done, but it is evidence of what must be done. So I'm going to beg my colleagues to please examine this bill, H.R. 8160, because clearly, if we don't have this enacted into law, this notion that we can at least do what uh, the Constitution says we uh, should do uh, by virtue of many sections of it, I, I won't go into them right now, but that is to uh, try to become an America where uh, everybody is treated equally, equality under the law. I'm very much disturbed by what the president has done. Now, let me ask one additional question. Uh, I have uh, in the past talked about how some 70% of the executive level senior positions at certain banks are held by men, uh, some 70%. Uh, that means that obviously about 30% of the positions are held by uh, women. In a country where more than 50% of the people are women, it just seems to me that this is further evidence of the need for the armies. Um, let me just ask each of you again uh, to tell me quickly with the few seconds that I have left, uh, tell me quickly about your belief in terms of what women bring to the workplace. Do women bring value to the workplace uh, such that we ought to have them uh, give us their opinions by way of being a part of the workforce? Ms. Cofield? Yes. Ms. Clark? Most definitely. Ms. Dingman? Definitely. Ms. Pearson? Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Davey? Yes. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, uh, Ms. Congressman Green. The chair now recognizes the distinguished member from Wisconsin, Congressman Steele. Style. Congressman Steele. Thank you very much, Chairwoman. I uh, appreciate you holding today's hearing um, and appreciate all of our panelists for being on uh, to discuss what's a really important topic. How do we create a more perfect union and get the inclusion and make sure that everyone uh, has a seat at the table? I spent some time, I had the opportunity to read uh, the some of the written testimony and wanted to ask you, uh, Ms. Pearson, uh, in particular, we, we hear a lot about uh, the difficulty on the recruiting side of getting underrepresented minorities um, into and at the table um, and wanted to just to dive in with you and some of the things that your organization is doing in particular as it relates to the mentorship side of this. We talk a lot about the need to make sure uh, underrepresented minorities, uh, women uh, have that network that they can rely on to be able to get that seat at the table um, in what you've been doing in particular as it relates to the internal process of the mentorship program of some of these groups. Ms. Pearson? Yes, thank you for that question. So at the FDIC, we have a variety of different ways, both formal and informal for those mentoring opportunities. So I first start with the informal. I talked to you how my, my recruiter that recruited me out of college still served as an informal mentor, calling me, checking in on me, make sure I was progressing. On the formal side, the FDIC has also a variety of different ways. If you are a staff level employee, you can be involved in our mentoring program where you're assigned to a more senior leader and you develop a leadership plan. In addition to that, we also have a specific plan for leaders. We have our leadership mentoring plan where managers can be partnered with more senior managers for their development. If you have an interest in becoming a leader, we also have a program for emerging leaders where you can receive coaching. 
In addition to that, we are now focused on some of our more senior leadership opportunities where we can take individuals that we identify who are high performing and partner them with specific assignments and higher levels that they may not normally get an opportunity to be exposed to because that awareness, um, having representation, all of those things help contribute to the success factors and it, and it did for me. Thank you very much, Ms. Pearson. I, I'm gonna, in the limited time I have here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump and I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Cofield and Ms. Clark, and in that order, we've heard a lot about some of the, uh, what I'll call a little bit 50,000 feet discussing some of the strategies. I would love for each of you, if you can, just to take a moment to talk about a specific story uh, where this has been impactful. I think sometimes when we personalize this and we talk about this as an individual, it helps some of us on the committee uh, and those watching better understand the work that's being done. And so if you have a story on that, Ms. Cofield, would love to hear how that's played out in a practical way for an individual who's benefited uh, by some of the strategies that you've employed um, at the OCC. Oh, gee, so I can think of many cases, but um, we particularly, um, with this year, last year and a half actually, dived down into our Hispanic barrier analysis because what we were seeing was, um, a low participation rate of Hispanics in our organization, even though we were hiring at the civilian labor force, what we noticed was that they did not stay on board. They did not stay with us from a, recruit, from a retention standpoint. And so we've done what we call a, a Hispanic area analysis. And out of that, we had an opportunity to gain information through focus group activities. And what we learned is so much involved in terms of what the employee experience is like. So not only were we able to get the numbers and get the looking at the movement from one job to another promotion opportunities, but we actually got to hear the stories from Hispanics themselves in terms of how life at OCC and the kinds of things that were supportive to them and the kinds of things that actually ended up being barriers to them. So thank, that's, thank you very that's much. A strategy. With Thank you very much. With, with the limited time, I'm going to try to jump to Ms. Clark. If you have a, a, a story where you can kind of personify this, that'd be terrific, I think, for all of us. Um, thank you very much. Um, one of the things is I've used myself. Um, I've been working since I was 16 years old. So, you know, there's a couple of decades in there that uh, I have been in play in business. I came to the Federal Reserve Board from uh, the private sector, and immediately I, I received a mentor who basically helped guide me through the culture of the organization, which I think is critical, and also enabled me to have an opportunity to understand what it was I needed to do as an individual to be successful within the organization. And we continue, having had that experience, I am more than willing to support anyone who has an interest and also provide them with resources to achieve their goals. And the board continues to do that today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. We're looking at the time, I will yield back. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chairwoman now recognizes the distinguished gentleman from Florida, Congressman Lawson, for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Beatty and Ranking Member Wagner uh, for hosting this hearing today. Uh, we are now on the fifth anniversary of Dodd-Frank. Uh, and one of the things that was found across the financial regulatory agency, African-American employees uh, generally receive lower performance rate management review scores uh, than white employees. And this is to all of the panelists. Uh, since this has been very prevalent and we are very well aware of it, what policies and practice, uh, uh, and I heard you all talk about mentors and so forth, uh, that uh, that have been implemented implemented uh, to alleviate some of the bias and problems in your performance review process that may have caused those performance rating disparities. To what extent have your agency corrected those rated, rating disparities since the uh, committee review uh, in 2015. And so I could just go down the line and maybe you all can let me know exactly one at the other so 
Uh, we'll start with you, Ms. Clark. Thank you, uh, Congressman Lawson. One of the things that the Federal Reserve Board has done on an annual basis, we review all of our performance ratings. I am involved in that process. We look to see if there are any outliers in the way in which people are being evaluated based on the criteria that we've established around the competencies and the performance that is needed. Uh, once we uh, review those performance ratings, we have discussions where there are issues. We have discussions with the divisions at which those issues persist in, and we work to find out exactly what is being done to make sure that everyone is treated on an equal plane and that the evaluations are done fairly and equitably. And we do this annually. We identify barriers to success, and then we also are engaged in making sure that people understand what the level of expectations are and that discrimination or any allegation um, that is prohibitive to one advancing themselves within the organization is removed. Okay, next. So this is Monica Davis 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 Davis. from NCUA. Uh, thank you so much. So one of the things we do besides reviewing our performance and evaluations to make sure that uh, there is consistency. We also make sure that in our mentoring program, we call it mentoring across differences. We try to make sure that when people get mentors, that they get someone outside of their group to make sure that people have exposure to other people. That's one of the really good ways that you can break down unconscious biases. We make sure that for our employee resource groups, that their executive sponsors are people that are not part of those groups. We do very focused training on unconscious bias because we know that unconscious bias can come into play when doing performance evaluations. So those are three things that I would say we do that would help deal with that issue. So this is Joyce Cofield from the OCC. Not dissimilar at all from what my colleagues have already offered up. We also, at our unconscious bias trainings, specifically with managers, dive down into the consequences of bias within our processes and our performance process is one of those that we highlight. So we're consciously um, not only uh, making sure that they're trained in this, but actually uh, show them how they use this in their everyday process uh, in and of itself. In addition, we provide um, past performance ratings to our managers prior to the upcoming performance rating so that they can see what their trends and, and performances looked at in the past, and then they can do their own self-reflections in terms of whether or not there are things that they need to consider differently. Ms. Pearson. Yes, so at the FDIC, like my colleagues, we also provide training to our rating managers and we have a robust review process. The part that I would like to add that I don't think I've heard yet is that we also train our employees and our managers on the rating process and we provide opp uh, opportunities for our employees to know how to put their best foot forward. And so when they are providing information and feedback to their managers, how can they explain information in a way to make sure that their best foot is forward. So in addition to the training that we do, and in addition to the robust process, we also make sure that our employees are prepared and all those things work together to make sure we reach our goal of a fair and equitable process. Okay, I think we have one. So this is Lacey Dingman from the New York Fed. And like my colleagues, we do a very similar process. I, I know that we're out of time, but I would say that like Nikita, we also focus extensively on training as well as how do we ensure that the process has carried itself through in evaluating those ratings every year to make sure that there is no unconscious bias or we mitigate unconscious bias in the process. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. I know we're running out of time and with that, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentle lady from Texas, Congresswoman Garcia, for five minutes for questions. Okay, I'm doing it from a cell phone. Can y'all hear me? We we can hear you and see you. Okay, great. At least two two uh, two things will make it work. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chairwoman, for for this. Um, uh, choosing this topic, I said, is so important. Uh, and I wanted to start with Ms. Uh, the 
the um, Ms. Dingham from New York. Uh, you mentioned a lot of the outreach and a lot of the programs that, that New York is doing. What What is, in your judgment, uh, the best tool that you all have that others should, should uh, use as the best practice to ensure that there's full participation from all the protected classes? I, I know I, I heard someone mention that they had an issue with retention of uh, Latinos. Uh, since you're from New York and have a, a lot of, of a very robust uh, Latino population, what, what is it that you may be doing that you might be able to share uh, that would help uh, recruit and retain uh, Latinos in your organization? Thank you, Representative Garcia, for that question. In regards to the second district, you're very correct. We have a, a strong Hispanic population and we work very hard to try and recruit in um, Hispanics. Unfortunately, we have not had the level of success that we would like to see, but we continue to um, work to have in our recruitment processes, diverse slates, um, trying to make sure that there's a variety of different thoughts and beliefs that are coming to the table for each position that we consider. And, um, and so I would say that's the key to continuing to go after that, as well as building robust relationships with outside organizations that can help um, build that pipeline with us. And so I think like many of my colleagues, we have a robust um, relationship management that we do with a variety of different um, Hispanic and African-American associations that help us build our pipeline. All right, uh, Ms. Davey, for you, I uh, follow up with that. Any particular challenges in your organization with not only uh, outreach programs uh, for, for all the protected groups, but also perhaps for any language barriers or, or difficulty, for example, for our seniors to make sure that they feel that they're included and that when you, they use one of your institutions, that they are not only people that look like them, but also speak like them. Sure, well, let me just do two parts. First, internally, we make sure that we are recruiting from Hispanic serving organizations and schools. Uh, I think one of the biggest impacts that has had in our organization is the creation of our Hispanic resource group, Cultura. That group is involved with us in recruiting, coming up with re uh, recruiting strategies. They also involve themselves in translation needs that we may have as an agency. Within the credit union system, it's extremely important that our credit unions are inclusive, that they look at their products and services to make sure that they're offering uh, products and services in different languages. And I think that that has had a huge impact in our uh, minority uh, depository institutions in the credit union space and making sure that they have representation uh, on their teller lines, on their boards, and on their management teams that reflect sure. the communities that they serve. Right, and Ms. Clark, I wanted to ask you, are you, you talked about a lot of your numbers, your mentoring, and all the programs that you might have. Uh, the biggest issue that, that I see with all these programs, and I've been following them for a long time, I used to be the city controller in Houston and dealt with all kinds of financial services group, particularly investment banking firms. The biggest, toughest thing is compliance. I mean, we can write all these rules. You can you can make it mandatory. You can decide to do it voluntary. It can be self-assessment or it can be imposed. But the real, real crux of the matter is how do we make these companies, how do we make your agencies comply? What would you be what would be your recommendation to Congress on, on what we could do for better compliance? In response, um, Congressman Garcia, um, are you addressing compliance for the event uh, entities that we regulate? You're speaking compliance in that regard? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think that it, you know, will be up to um, the congressional members to and Congress to put forth what they feel is necessary uh, in order um, to have the institutions be compliance. And I think. What I'm asking you is what recommend that would make it easier for you to help with compliance? I mean, again, it's, we can switch from voluntary to mandatory, but we still have to make people do it. I think what, what would be helpful is, I think the more information that we're able to receive and know what the practices are of the institutions that we regulate, the better we are able to serve the intention of the uh, legislation that was issued. Um, I believe that continued dialogue and meeting and conversing with each other uh, and being intentional on the things that we do would make it much more successful. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Beatty. I believe I'm back by right around the time. 
Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentlewoman from Pennsylvania, Congresswoman Dean, for five minutes for questions. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. Thank you, Chairwoman Beatty. Thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with you. And so uh, I wanted to first quickly ask a follow up to the question uh, that Representative Green asked about uh, the news reporting of September the 5th uh, that the Trump administration had instructed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity trainings. Uh, and that that was followed by an OMB uh, mailing to uh, federal agencies. So I wanted to ask just a yes or no. We'll go right down the line uh, prior to the OMB notice. Uh, or after, has the Trump administration asked uh, your agencies uh, to stop diversity and sensitivity training? If I could start with uh, Ms. Cofield. Uh, I'm not aware of that, no. Okay, thank you. Ms. Clark. I'm not aware also that they have. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Dignam. Dignam. No, not that I'm aware of. Okay. Uh, and uh, Ms. Pearson? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, and Ms. Davey? No, not that I'm aware of. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, so much of the information that you're talking about and the good work that you're doing um, revolves around who we hire. Uh, and so one of the things that we know uh, that we've learned uh, of the importance of diverse hiring panels uh, to ensure that a large range of perspectives are offered when evaluating potential employees. Uh, we know that hiring committees and panels with little to no diversity can bring bias, even un unintended bias. If everybody looks the same, everybody has a similar background and experience, there will be necessarily some built-in bias uh, in the review of applicants. To that end, and I'll go through each of you again, um, in terms of diverse hiring panels, what is your agency doing to ensure that? Uh, Ms. Cofield, please. So we have a general rule that our panels are diverse. And in fact, at our executive committee, we actually check in with each other on a regular basis as decisions are made relative to selections as to what the diversity of the panel is and give each other feedback as to whether or not the concept of diversity is in the intent of that diversity is in fact real. So the, the diversity of the panel is a very important, critical issue relative to the selection process at OCC. That's great, and it must be intentional. Absolutely right. Ms. Clark? At the Federal Reserve Board, um, we also um, have a process by which um, the recruitment process enables people to uh, attend training on uh, bias in the recruiting process. We have diverse panels for all of our positions, particularly on official staffs. I am involved in that process and I am uh, in the process so that I can determine whether or not we are being inclusive, not only from those who are being uh, the interviewers, but also the candidate pools who are put forth. And so that is a regular part of our process overall. Diversity is key. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ms. Dignam for uh, the Fed of New York. We also have a diverse paneling process, very similar to my colleagues. We ensure that we have um, several panels that participate in each of our hiring selections. And then we review those metrics after the um, process is concluded to make sure that we have uh, maintained that process in its, um, in, in its entirety. And so we feel like that has helped us in mitigating unconscious bias. And is that a, a newer practice? That has been a practice since my time here at the bank, but admittedly, that's only been in the last year, but I would say that it's been long before my time. Terrific. Uh, and uh, Ms. Pearson. At the FDIC, we do recommend the best practice of having diverse panels. In addition to that, we provide unconscious bias to our hiring managers. And the third thing that we do is there's a selecting official, but there is also a review process where there's an approval official who reviews that particular selection for our job opportunities. Thank you very much. And uh, Ms. Davey. Yes, at the NCUA, we have a policy of whenever possible that there be the inclusion of a minority or women representation on all, on all interviewing panels. 
That's fantastic. I'm glad to hear all of that. We do know that uh, in order to be successful uh, at, at recognizing and prizing and hiring in diverse ways, um, we have to be intentional. We have to critically examine uh, who, is, um, who are our applicants, who is in the pipeline, but also who is reviewing them. So I thank you all for your leadership there, and I yield back the remainder of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank all of our witnesses for their testimony today. And without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to provide to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. The committee will now stand in recess for no longer than five minutes as we transition to our second panel of witnesses. Thank you.
will now come to order. We welcome the testimony of our second panel of witnesses. Witnesses are Lorraine Cole, is the Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the United States Department of the Treasury. Pamela Gibbs is the Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Sharon Levine is the Director, Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. And Laura McCray is the Director of the Office of Minority Women Inclusion of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Witnesses are reminded that your oral testimony will be limited to five minutes. A chime will go off at the end of your time, and I ask that you respect the members and other witnesses' time by wrapping up your oral testimony. Without objection, your written statement will be made part of the record. Ms. Cole, you are now recognized for five minutes to give an oral presentation on your testimony. Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify and share the diversity and inclusion efforts of Treasury's headquarters. Diversity and inclusion emerged as a discipline over the past 50 years or so, but I prefer to trace these values to the words on the great seal of the United States, E Pluribus Unum out of many, one. Of course, hundreds of thousands of people were enslaved when that motto came to be in 1776. So our nation's practices did not exactly align with its founding principles. But we can celebrate that this has been our longstanding ideal and our continuing quest to this day. So I'm pleased to have this opportunity to share Treasury's ongoing work toward this end, including topics from our most recent annual report and activities undertaken in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Treasury has continued to increase utilization of minority-owned and women-owned businesses. For example, in FY 2019, more than one-third of the contracts for Treasury departmental offices amounting to $112 million were awarded to minority and women-owned businesses. These were among the highest levels since OMWI began tracking such contracting. Treasury has also worked to strengthen and sustain small and minority-owned banks. Two years ago, Treasury launched a program to engage large commercial banks with small and minority-owned banks in mentor-protege relationships. Last year, Secretary Mnuchin personally championed the expansion of this program by writing to the CEOs of 26 of the largest banks to invite their participation. Treasury supported participation of minority depository institutions as lenders in the Paycheck Protection Program. On March 3rd of this year, when Treasury commemorated the 155th anniversary of Freedmen's Bank, we never could have envisioned that MDIs would be called upon weeks later to address the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. When the Paycheck Protection Program closed, 175 MDIs had approved over 123,000 PPP loans, providing more than $10 billion to small businesses. In addition, 27% of all PPP funds were dis distributed to low and moderate income communities, which is proportionate to their percentage of the population. Treasury strives to, to increase workforce diversity at all levels of the agency. 36% of employees across all grade levels in Treasury's headquarters are racial or ethnic minorities, and 44% of all employees are women. We strive to promote a workplace culture where diversity and inclusion is accepted as the responsibility of every employee. 
For instance, all senior executives have a diversity and inclusion element written into their performance plan. And when the eight AMWI directors jointly hosted a discussion on race and racism following the George Floyd killing, one third of the 9,000 people who voluntarily participated were Treasury employees. Treasury works to inspire tomorrow's leaders. We conduct the Treasury Scholars Program, hosting talented minority students as interns from leading colleges and universities, including HBCUs Hispanic, and Hispanic-serving institutions. These experiences provide them with marketable skills, inspire them to consider public service careers, and even position them for future employment at Treasury. So in the spirit of E Pluribus Unum, we take seriously our obligation to ensure that those who do the work of Treasury as employees, contractors, or financial agents are representative of the beneficiaries of our work, the American people. I look forward to answering any questions you may have for me. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sharon Levine is the Director of Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Federal Housing Agency. You will have five minutes for your testimony. Good afternoon, Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the invitation to appear at today's hearing. Since October 2014, I've had the honor of serving as Director of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion of the Federal Housing Finance Agency. As this is my first opportunity to testify before you, let me express FHFA's appreciation for the work of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion. Central to FHFA's success is our commitment to diversity and inclusion at both the agency and our regulated entities. This has been true for as long as I've worked at FHFA, and as I'll discuss in a moment, it has been a top priority of Director Calabria since he joined the agency 17 months ago. Our daily efforts to build and sustain a work environment where everyone feels safe, respected, and valued for our differences are always important and a prerequisite for FHUA to be a world-class regulator as Congress intended. But today, this work has taken on added significance and urgency. The tragic loss of life and civil unrest that have roiled our nation in recent months, as well as inequities that have plagued too many communities for far too long, have left many of our colleagues feeling vulnerable and distressed. But these events have also strengthened our resolve to ensure that racism and hate are never tolerated at FHFA. I am proud of FHFA's AMWI for stepping up this year with Director Calabria's strong encouragement to support our colleagues and help our entire agency grow during this time. As the Director has said many times in recent months, we must do better. And I am grateful for his steadfast support of AMWI as we have endeavored to answer that call within our agency. FHFA's commitment to diversity and inclusion extends far beyond our recent efforts to respond to external events, because it is both a core value and a statutory responsibility. The Housing and Economic Recovery Act of 2008 requires FHFA to take affirmative steps to seek diversity in its workforce at all levels of the agency, consistent with the demographic diversity of the United States. To lead that effort, FHFA established its OMLI in January 2011, pursuant to Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act. And unlike other federally regulated financial institutions, our regulated entities are required by law to establish an OMLI or its functional equivalent to promote diversity and ensure inclusion in all business activities. Today, I will provide an overview of our work to fulfill those statutory responsibilities. This work is described in more detail in my written testimony as well as our 2019 Omni Annual Report to Congress, which FHFA released in March 2020, and which is attached to my written testimony. FHFA has a strong track record of promoting diversity at every level of the agency's workforce, including management and executives. In fact, I am proud to say that FHFA has one of the most diverse workforces amongst federal financial regulatory agencies. 
but that does not mean that our work is complete. Indeed, from his very first day in office, Director Calabria has taken steps to raise the profile and strengthen the impact of FHFA's army. On his arrival to the agency, the director ensured that the army director's position on FHFA's executive committee was strengthened. The director has provided leadership necessary for the agency to take concrete steps and undertake pioneering new initiatives to uphold fairness, diversity, and inclusion as foundational values of all that we do. These steps include elevating the new Office of Equal Opportunity and Fairness into its own division level office under the director, conducting FHFA's second diversity and inclusion climate assessment, instituting mandatory unconscious bias training for all employees, commissioning and conducting barrier analyses to ensure fair and equitable wages, merit promotion procedures, and opportunities across the agency, launching the agency's first diversity advisory council that will help elevate and support agency diversity and inclusion initiatives, utilizing the agency's internship program to foster a diverse employee pipeline, and prioritizing AMU's special emphasis program events, the second most recent of which hosted historian Richard Rothstein to discuss his book, The Color of Law. In the interest of time, I will conclude by noting that my written testimony contains more details about these initiatives and FHFA's work to direct and supervise the diversity and inclusion programs at the regulated entities. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Gibbs, you are now recognized for five minutes to give oral presentation on your testimony. Thank you. Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and members of the subcommittee, Thank you for the opportunity to testify today to highlight SEC's efforts to enhance diversity, inclusion, and opportunity. I commend this committee for its role in passing Section 342, for your vision and commitment to equality and access to opportunity. Section 342 has had a significant impact on the federal financial regulatory agencies and the entities that we regulate and is largely responsible for the advances made by women and minorities over the years. Since its inception, the SEC's OMWI has focused its, its critical mandate under Section 342 of the Dodge Bank with the goal of developing and implementing programs that would lead to enhanced diversity, inclusion, and opportunity for women and minorities at the SEC, the industry we regulate, and underrepresented communities. The outcomes achieved over the years with regards to hiring, promotions, business supplier diversity, training, outreach efforts, and interaction with our regulated entities demonstrates that the SEC's ONWI has been effective at promoting change. During my tenure, the diversity and inclusion efforts have moved from a place of theoretical discussions about programmatic activities to the implementation of significant strategies and actions that have resulted in tangible outcomes with regard to workforce, supplier diversity, assessment of our regulated entities, particularly under the leadership of Chairman Jay Clayton. At the SEC, the 4,500 talented men and women are our most important assets. Their expertise is essential to the effective oversight and regulation of our vast, complex, and ever-changing capital markets. Promoting diversity and inclusion in our workforce is not only a shared agency commitment, it is also value enhancing. At the SEC, I believe that our efforts have provided tangible proof of this value proposition. Increased diversity inclusion has enhanced SEC's performance and as a result, benefited investors, issuers, and other market partic participants. In addition to the efforts at SEC, um, we also provide leadership and guidance on diversity and inclusions on matters that affect market participants and the entities that we regulate. First, AMWI um, is engaged with each of the SEC's external advisory committees and has provided direct input to these committees to ensure that all have embraced the need for hearing diverse perspectives of members critical to the success of the committees. Recent candidate selections and public meetings evidence this understanding. We're also looking to the industry we regulate to be leaders in promoting opportunities 
for historically underrepresented populations within their workforces. We have conducted significant outreach in this regard. Earlier this year, the SEC again issued its diversity assessment report to our regulated entities. And we have continued to look for creative ways to incentivize participation in this initiative. We continue to remain encouraged with the progress of our regulated entities, and on we will continue to take steps to encourage engagement and collaboration for our entities. Finally, ONWI has implemented an outreach and technical assistance strategy that has increased minority and women-owned businesses' awareness of SEC's requirements and participation in agency contracting, resulting in sustained improvements over the eight years during my tenure as ONWI director. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify with my fellow ONWI directors today on this important topic. While I believe that the SEC has come a long way in its efforts to promote diversity and inclusion, there's still much work that needs to be done. We will continue to emphasize its commitment to respect, diversity, inclusion, and opportunity for all. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. And now, Ms. McRae, you will be recognized for five minutes to give uh, five minutes testimony on your oral presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Beatty, Ranking Member Wagner, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to update you on our initiatives at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. I'm Laura McRae, the Bureau's OMWI Director. I'm pleased to share with you some of the Bureau's proactive efforts to integrate diversity and inclusion across the Bureau and in our business. As noted in the most recent Office of Minority and Women Inclusion Annual Report, in fiscal year 2019, with the support of Bureau leadership, we saw increases in gender and ethnic and racial diversity in our workforce. We expanded our recruitment and outreach efforts to attract diverse staff. We conducted extensive outreach to entities we regulate to understand their DNI practices and developed an online system to collect and analyze that information. We continued cultural programming to foster a more inclusive workplace. And finally, we expanded our strategies to include minority and women-owned businesses and bureau contracting opportunities. I actively work to fulfill the statutory mandates of Section 342 of the Dodd-Frank Act to ensure that regulations, policies, and financial solutions developed by the Bureau are relevant for all consumers and to fully integrate DNI into our organization. Given the challenges our country is facing as we struggle to deal with the continued incidence of racial violence and inequity, advancing DNI is more important than ever. Under leadership of Director Craninger, I implemented a forward leaning action plan shortly after the tragic death of George Floyd on May 25th to assist staff and management with tools and resources in dealing with these events. I collaborated with my peers to deliver a federal multi-financial agency, OMWI webcast on race on June 24th. In addition, OMWI created racial equity learning resources for all Bureau employees and that address specific racial issues such as anti-racism, bias, and white privilege, as well as management-focused guidelines for addressing racial bias, racial issues in the workplace. My team is continuing to work with and support staff as they deal with these ongoing issues. The Bureau's mission is best accomplished with a qualified, diverse, and inclusive workforce that reflects the nation's diversity. The Bureau has developed a robust outreach and recruiting efforts at colleges and universities, trade associations, and professional organizations, including minority and women focused organizations. And as a result of that, we've built a diverse competitive workforce. As of July 2020, women make up 50% of the Bureau's workforce, minority employees make up 41% of the workforce, and with respect to leadership, 49% are women compared to 34% government-wide, and 36% are minorities compared to 21% government-wide. In January 2020, the Bureau launched an online data collection tool called Inclusivity to collect and manage submit diversity self-assessment data from our regulated entities. We reached out to over a thousand institutions to encourage them to submit their DNI assessments. Although the response rate has been impacted by the pandemic, 
we continue to conduct direct outreach to the entities and to work with trade organizations to educate financial institutions on the benefits of DNI and to encourage them to adopt best practices. The Bureau also engages in an array of initiatives to promote an inclusive work environment, foster equity, collaboration, and greater productivity. Each month, I issue a message to all employees sharing information, resources, and perspectives on DNI topics. In January, the Bureau launched the Mentoring for Success program to enhance professional development. It includes 35 matched mentor protege pairs that meet regularly, a leadership speaker series, and group discussions on career development. And the Bureau continues to prioritize business opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses. We conduct targeted outreach to encourage MWABs to seek business opportunities with the Bureau and provide technical assistance, including our quarterly How to Do Business with the Bureau series. Our efforts have resulted in positive trends, going from 9.2% spend with MWABs in FY 2017 to 28.9% in FY 2019. And in the current fiscal year, we're on track to see further increases in this area. In conclusion, while we made significant progress on our DNI strategies in 2020, there's more that the Bureau can accomplish. And our commitment to serve the interests of all consumers, it's critical that we reflect the ways that consumers from different backgrounds, cultures, and perspectives interact in the financial marketplace. I look forward to working with the subcommittee to achieve the goals of Section 342, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Ms. Gibbs, in 2018, the SEC invited nearly some 1,400 regulated entities to submit self-assessment, yet only about 38 responded. I certainly appreciate your enthusiasm and hope. Can you tell me, is there anything we can do or why do you think uh, that you had so few uh, to submit their assessments? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, thinking back to 2018, um, one of the biggest reasons why I think that we've had such low response rates is primarily because of lack of understanding. I think at that particular time, people really, the, enti the entities that we regularly did not quite understand what we were doing. I'm pleased to say that the SEC has gone out with a second round of diversity assessment reports, and the numbers are much more uh, pleasing uh, and have Im drastically improved, I would say. And, and that's because we've done a lot more outreach. We've engaged our regulated entities. We've talked about the diversity assessment re report. Chairman Clayton talks about so you are diversity. hopeful, and I don't want to cut you off, but I have okay. a question. So you're hopeful that the numbers will go up? Yes, as, as, as the more our entities much. understand it. Thank you. Ms. McRae, can you tell us why the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau only began collecting data uh, this year? Certainly. Um, so I joined the Bureau in January of 2019. And could you speak up a little, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. So I joined the Bureau in January of 2019. So I'm speaking based on information I, that was um, that I learned as I came into the Bureau. My understanding was that under the previous leadership, they had been looking to do outreach and engagement with the entities to get a more robust understanding of what barriers might exist and understand where the different institutions were okay. in terms of diversity and inclusion in the marketplace. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Levine, FHFA is subject to Section 1116, as you know, of the HERA. Can you uh, share how you have leveraged your authority to collect data from regulated entities? Yes, we uh, developed and implemented an examination program in 2017. So we have almost completed four years of examining our regulated entity, entities, rather. And we have collected very detailed data uh, that conforms to our minority and women inclusion rule. Uh, we collect quarterly data and that is rolled up into annual data. Uh, that way we're able to analyze that data and determine the, the performance of the regulated entities as well as trends. 
Okay, thank you. As systemic racism continues to impede full economic inclusion of diverse communities, AMWIs were created in part, as you all know, to help ensure to prevent abusive practices. This is a yes or no question for everyone. Do you believe systemic racism exists? Ms. Cole, yes or no? Yes, absolutely. Ms. Gibbs? Yes. Ms. Levine? Yes, I do. Ms. McCray. Ms. McCray, are you there? Oh, I'm sorry, I was muted. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, also, I'd like to um, enter into a record, uh, a letter that came from the executive office of the president from the office of uh, management and budget that makes uh, a statement. I won't read it, but I'll enter in the, rec in the records and without objection. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this letter, but uh, basically, it made a statement that when we look at training for diversity and inclusion, that it should be ceased and desisted from using. Do you think any of your trainers or training perpetuates uh, a view that all white people contribute to racism or benefit from it? Uh, and this is from their letter. And that's a yes or no. And we'll go Ms. Cole, Ms. Gibbs, Ms. Levine, Ms. McCray. No, that does not characterize any of our training. Thank you. Ms. Gibbs? No, no, it does not characterize any of the training at the SEC. Ms. Levine and Ms. McCray? Not at all. Would you uh, also say that your training and the work that you do with Omni has been value enhancing? Yes or no? Yes, it has. Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I yield back. My time is up. Now I recognize the distinguished gentleman from Ohio, Congressman Gonzalez for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Chairwoman Beatty, and thank you to the second panel uh, for being a part of today's hearing. Um, I have a, a series of questions I'm just gonna try to run through quickly because I know our time's short. Uh, I'm gonna start with Ms. Cole. Uh, as there are so many challenges each day throughout the past six months, how has the Treasury Department maintained a focus on promoting diversity and inclusion throughout the pandemic? Well, initially, um, af certainly after the, um, the killing of George Floyd, we knew that there was a lot of trauma uh, within the nation um, and among our employees. Uh, we know that individuals don't leave that pain, that confusion, that anger at the door when they come to work. So we knew that it was important for us to address these issues, not um, only as a compassionate uh, um, activity, but also <clears throat> as an important uh, uh, business uh, decision, uh, because we know that, that uh, this can a affect productivity. So one of the things we did as, as a group, as an AMWI group, was to uh, put on a program to address the, uh, the feelings, the, um, the issues, and, and some of the solutions and actions that could be taken by employees. Uh, relative to the uh, upheaval that was um, precipitated by the George Floyd incident. Thank you. And was that just amongst the Omni staff, or was that the Omni staff sort of spearheaded the initiative and all of Treasury participated? Uh, it was. It, it was the, the Omni staff, and, and actually it was an interagency uh, activity with all of the Omni, uh, the eight Omnis, and it was open to all Treasury employees. Very good. Thank you. Um, my next question uh, will be for Ms. Gibbs. Uh, one thing that we've talked about a lot in this committee, this subcommittee, uh, and, and I hear it often, is there are not enough opportunities for minority businesses to manage assets for pensions. So, um, you know, the, the opportunity to participate as, as asset managers, which is, a, a, of course, 
an incredibly lucrative field um, and, and a wonderful opportunity for those fortunate to be in that field. Um, so my, my question is, in, in your role, I'd just be curious to hear your perspective on the steps that need to be taken to make sure that we have more diverse fund managers uh, and more opportunities for, for those in the asset management field. So thank you, Congressman, for that question. Uh, it is a very important uh, uh, question to the SEC. So the SEC has four advisory committees, and one of our advisory co committees is the Asset Management Advisory Committee. And so in my uh, partnership relationships over the years, I've had an outstanding relationship with the National Association of Securities Professionals. And this issue has come up uh, a number of times over the years. And so what I would say is, is that I'm pleased to say that the SEC has started to look at this uh, issue around diverse asset managers and uh, uh, what the SEC's rules can do, if we can do anything additional to help minorities. So we held a wonderful panel in July that explored and outlined the issue. What is the issue that diverse asset managers face? Uh, we're having a second panel on September 16th that will continue to explore this issue and hopefully help uh, develop solutions that can address the underlying cause of like a um, utilization of diverse asset managers. Thank you, and I'd like to encourage you to continue on in the initiative. Um, my final question is Ms. McCray. I don't know if I'm getting feedback on this, but uh, in, in your view, how have minority communities in particular been impacted by fraud during the pandemic? Um, I know that that's been a, a major issue. I'd love to just hear how they've been targeted and, and any steps, we, anything we should be aware of uh, in, our, in our position. So thank you. And I'll start off by saying I'm probably not the best person at the Bureau to impact that we, to give information on that. We have a whole team of people who focus very specifically on it. What I will say in terms of my understanding of minority communities and how they're affected by things that are going on, uh, we've seen historically, and this time is no different, that when you have these kinds of situations coming down, minority communities tend to be more impacted and more negatively impacted. The lack of information, they tend to have more lack of information, they tend to have less access to resources, and so they will feel the brunt of something that's going on more so than the majority community will. One of the things the Bureau has been doing over the course of the pandemic is really issuing a lot of information so that we can help inform minority communities to make them aware of their rights, to make them aware of what to be on the lookout for, you know, to make them aware to be on the lookout for scams and how to deal with those. We have an excellent complaint system at the Bureau where people can, you know, file a complaint if they are fall victim to something like that or believe they've been I think my time is my time exactly, but oh I'm sorry <laughs> you're welcome thank you it is my honor now to go to the distinguished gentleman from Missouri and chair of the housing and insurance committee congressman clay Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. And this is, I, I find this hearing to be quite productive and I appreciate you holding it. Uh, in, um, and this is for, for the entire panel. In 2015, uh, House Financial Services Committee staff report on the fifth anniversary of Dodd-Frank found that across the financial regulatory agencies, African-American employees generally received lower performance manage management review scores than white employees. And to all the panel panelists, what policies and practices uh, have your offices implemented to help eliminate bias and other problems in your performance review processes uh, and that may have caused those performance ratings disparities. Uh, and to what extent have your agencies corrected those ratings disparities since the committee's 2015 review? Whoever wants to start and jump in, please proceed. Okay, um, this is Ms. McRae. I'll start. 
What I will say is that the CFPB, we um, did an assessment and really looked at the performance rating system. We ended up changing um, and our system into a two party, a two level rating system. We also did a review of all of our personnel standards to really make sure that they were accurate. And we have added to our performance management process training for everyone, training for the managers who are going to be doing the review process, as well as training for the people who are, you know, filling out self-assessments and who are being reviewed. Um, in addition, in our process, we've included more of a feedback loop. There's an opportunity for people to do a self-assessment and provide that to their manager who's going to be doing their rating. So they're having that opportunity to bring things to the manager's attention. We also have been included check-in meetings and coaching as well, again, to try to make sure that uh, employees are able to communicate what they're doing and that managers are able to get an accurate assessment. And as I said, with the standards, making sure the standards that are being used to do the measurement are accurate. And so uh, just follow up, Ms. McCray, you are confident in the metrics being used uh, to hold management accountable uh, for, for these evaluations. Yes, I am. And actually, the one thing I would add is that, um, and this actually goes to the earlier question about training, part of our training is really we include in our training for supervisors training on unconscious bias to make sure that they, people are aware not to bring their biases into the performance management process. And it's a mandatory training that everyone who becomes a supervisor at the Bureau has to take. Thank you. Uh, Sharon, Levine, how do you hold uh, management accountable for these evaluations? FHRA has done several things. To begin with, the director recently established an office of equal opportunity and fairness, which he did in January when he uh, restructured the, uh, the agency's divisions. And that will be one of the topics that and issues that will be uh, looked into by the uh, particular division. In addition to that, FHFA has elevated diversity and inclusion as a competency. And so that is included in the, uh, the JPP, the job performance plan of every manager and supervisor. Uh, moreover, we have an annual managers conference where managers and supervisors are actually uh, trained in a number of areas, including uh, spotting and recognizing unconscious bias. Um, in, in all aspects of the uh, of the employment life cycle. So recruiting, uh, hiring, uh, interviewing, any number of those areas. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Gibbs, can you share with us what happens at your agency? So since 20, 2015, I would say that the, what we put in a number of increased protocols, training and guidance around performance management. Also, our performance management system has changed a little bit over the years, meaning that we've gone through a five-tier process to a three-tier process. Some of the many things that um, Director McCray from CFPB has highlighted. Also, uh, protocols calibration processes are put in place to make sure that, you know, how you calibrate the system and are there any biases that are part of the system. We have an EEO office uh, at the SEC that's separate from the OMWI office. And that office looks at and continues to look at on a, a continuing basis, not just when asked, uh, whether or not there are particular parts of our system that has bias or barriers in it that impedes full utilization of our workforce. So I think, so the bottom line is, I said, we've come a long way since 2015 and we have added protocols in place to avoid uh, any bias in our system. Thank you, Ms. Gibb. Madam Chair, uh, was that a, a buzzer for me? Uh, yes, the gentleman's time is up. All right. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Texas, who is also the chairman of the Oversight and Investigation Committee, Congressman Green, for five minutes for questions. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to have the opportunity to speak again. I want to go back to H.R. 8160, uh, the bill that would require the regulators to examine whether or not diversity and, and inclusion is being met in the various agencies that they regulate. And I'm going back to it because I understand that there are some people who would say that uh, this is not enough 
Um, and to those persons, I would simply want to contend that this may not be enough, but it's my belief that when even when you can't do enough, you should at least do all that you can. And I think that this is something that can be done. Uh, this bill does not in any way encroach upon anything other than the invidious discrimination that takes place, the inability of minorities to achieve status among the upper management in these corporations. Uh, and to those who would say, well, uh, this bill um, uh, will force people to do what they can do voluntarily. Uh, the retort to this is, of course, if this could be done voluntarily, it would have been done. We've had 10 years of Dodd-Frank and it has not been done. I would believe that uh, over the 10 year period, if we could have accomplished this without legislation, we would have. So HR 8160 is a means by which we can have regulators examine whether or not this diversity and inclusion is actually taking place. Are we really eliminating the systemic racism that exists in the country? Uh, there's something called a CAMELS rating system, and this rating system is a means by which uh, international uh, organizations are rated, and I see no reason why we can't have the same rating system that is accepted internationally to uh, be used for what we are doing currently. Um, the CAMELS rating system uh, will test the capital adequacy, the assets, the management capability, the earnings, liquidity, and sensitivity of various corporations. Well, we're just asking that diversity and inclusion be examined as well and require that there be diversity officers within these organizations, that there be meetings uh, to take place, contrary to, of course, what the uh, president would have. Uh, in the president's America, uh, it is anti-American to have diversity and inclusion as an agenda item. Uh, unfortunately, he has an America that um, is shrinking. Uh, most people I believe in this country want to see everybody treated fairly and equally. And to do this, we can simply wait for it to happen or we can have legislation comparable to what we are presenting to this body. So I'm asking my colleagues to please take a look at this legislation and give me your thoughts on it. Uh, it is anti-American to do what the president is doing, and that is to ban diversity training and call it anti-American. Uh, the president's doing the country a disservice with this kind of behavior, and my hope is that we will have legislation in place such that future presidents will uh, honor the, um, the, the will of the country and the Constitution. Now, let me just ask quickly of uh, uh, Ms. Cole. Uh, Ms. Cole, uh, do you find uh, diversity and inclusion to be um, something that is beneficial not only for the people who are the centerpiece of the diversity and inclusion, but also for people in general within the corporate structure? Uh, could you give me a yes or no, please, ma'am? Oh, that, that's a definite yes. Okay, and Ms. Uh, Gibbs, a similar question to you, diversity and inclusion, does it benefit the entirety of the corporation as opposed to just the people who are the, the focus of the diversity and inclusion, meaning the women and minorities? Is that a yes or a no? Uh, yes to both. Okay, and to Ms. Uh, Levine? Yes, and that has been validated by the responses from our, uh, our workforce. And uh, uh, Ms. McCray? Yes, it benefits everyone. Uh, finally, this, uh, just a closing comment. Um, I think that, uh, Madam Chair, you are truly to be commended for uh, this hearing. Uh, this hearing really brings into focus this need for the diversity and inclusion training, as well as for legislation that will require this kind of training in various entities that are regulated by the federal government. So I thank you again for, for what you're doing, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Congressman Gray. Uh, I now have the distinguished honor to ask the gentleman from Florida, Congressman Lawson, five minutes for questions. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, and this uh, question can start off with Ms. Clark, and then uh, we can go down the line. 
Uh, during the global pandemic, C CDFIs have uh, stepped up to provide mortgage forbearance, loan deferments, and modification to help address uh, uh, the need of borrowers. Ms. Clark, with respect to the ongoing pandemic, to what extent, extent has your OMW's eyes have been engaged, eager, engaged in proposals to enhance the work of the MDI, I'm tired of all these uh, acronyms, but anyway, MDI's uh, during the pandemic response. For example, ensuring that MDI's and minority CDF CDFIs are able to fully participate in the PPP uh, Main Street lending programs. Um, well, first of all, uh, the Treasury took a lot of uh, uh, energy into ensuring that MDIs participated into the um, in the PPP program as lenders. Um, during the uh, second round, guidance was issued to the lenders to uh, redouble their efforts to support small businesses. Uh, a set aside uh, was um, established so that loan funds uh, would be designated for my, for MDIs for small business lending. Um, that the uh, uh, deputy secretary and the SBA administrator held a round table with MDI lenders uh, to gain insight uh, for, for policy improvements uh, to the lending program. Um, and, and there was close monitoring throughout the PPP program to ensure that uh, we understood the lending pat patterns throughout and that there was that there was transparency to identify gaps uh, in funding. Uh, you had mentioned the um, uh, CDFI fund um, in uh, FY 2019. CDFI uh, awarded nearly 16 million dollars to MDI banks and credit unions that that support predominantly minority communities. And then earlier this year, when we uh, uh, were commemorating the one. 55th anniversary of the uh, Freedmen's Bank, we convened about 200 professionals to discuss uh, MDI programs within the federal government and to highlight uh, uh, the things that they're doing and to get feedback on things that we could do better. Okay, uh, and and so uh, so. According to what you just said, that means that you all implemented uh, uh, policies to uh, to ensure that agency contracts um, are making a good face effort toward workforce diversity. Uh, I beg your pardon. Well, in terms of in terms of workforce diversity, we do. Um, First of all, Treasury it doesn't have uh, it's not a regulator. Is so we're we're the only OMWI agency that is not a regulatory agency. So we don't have regulated entities that uh, that fall under the uh, mandate to ensure workforce diversity of regulated entities. However, we do do uh, analysis of contractors to ensure contractor workforce diversity is part of the good faith effort mandate that is part of, of, um, of Section 342. And, and we do that, um, we do that annually. We, we do a, a good faith effort analysis of a random sampling of, uh, of trade contractors, Treasury uh, Departmental Office contractors. Okay, I have less than a minute. Is this true with the rest of the panel uh, in terms of contractors uh, making a good face effort? Do everyone look at that the same way? Yes, FHFA does. On an annual basis, we do a review of all our contractors to ensure that they're making a good faith effort with regard to diversity and inclusion in their workforce, as well as applicable subcontractors. Okay, I got about 20 um, seconds left. And, 
CFPB includes in our contract a clause about the GFE requirement to make contractors aware, and we do an analysis and also request them to submit information to us so we can verify that they're making that good faith effort. Okay, thank you for ringing the bell for me to continue uh, to I yield back. I yield. Thank, thank you, Congressman Lawson. Uh, the chair now recognizes the distinguished woman from Pennsylvania, Congresswoman Dean. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I thank you and all our panelists uh, for coming together today to discuss this important topic. Uh, I'm delighted to be on this subcommittee to examine diversity and inclusion uh, as closely as we can in order to move us forward. Uh, we know that diversity is our strength. I'd like to ask each of the panelists uh, rather quickly in a follow up to what Representative Green talked about, which is the reporting of September the 5th that the Trump administration had instructed federal agencies to end racial sensitivity trainings. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, each of the directors from these very important agencies, uh, what direction either before or after the OMB letter had you received? What direction, suggestion, um, had you received from the administration in terms of diversity training and possibly suspending or ending some of it? I'll start first uh, with Treasury Director Cole. Yes, uh, to date we have not received any instructions uh, uh, in terms of our uh, diversity training. So um, you know that that came out, I guess, late Friday and. Uh, as of this point, we don't have any de definitive instructions about uh, how to move forward. Thank you. Director Gibbs for SEC. Uh, prior to September 5th, we had received no guidance as it relates to diversity training. And beyond that, since that time? Uh, we're, still, we're still waiting for guidance. I believe the OMB uh, memorandum said that further guidance would be offered to the agencies. And Director Levine for FHFA. To my knowledge, we have received nothing. Thank you. Um, Director McRae for CFPB. Uh, we haven't received any direction on that either before or after. Thank you very much. Uh, I also wanted to talk about hiring panels, uh, that we know that uh, in order to break down the barriers uh, for um, a, a more diverse population in our hiring, uh, we need to make sure that the hiring panels are diverse themselves. Uh, because when evaluating potential employees, we know that panels that have very little diversity can bring bias, even if it is unintended, uh, just a bias of a common background. Uh, and so um, for reviewing applicants, what are your agencies your, and under your OMWI direction uh, doing regarding hiring diverse or, or using diverse hiring panels? And I'll just go in the same order. Director Cole for Treasury. Yes, it's a policy within Treasury that the uh, executive review boards that are formed uh, particularly to, uh, to evaluate and to recommend uh, executive level candidates for, for positions, it, it is a requirement that those panels are diverse. Thank you. And uh, Director Gibbs, SEC. Uh, the SEC has a very robust uh, hiring process uh, that inc incorporates objective questions uh, and also diverse hiring uh, diverse hiring panels at all levels. So you always are using diverse hiring panels. Yes, to the extent that we can. Okay, uh, Director Levine. FHFA FHFA's practice is to use diverse hiring panels as we go up. And so uh, at the executive level and the supervisory levels, we do have diverse panels. How about at the entry level? Not as much. That is, it, it is not a policy, but we are, we are trying to uh, make that a broader practice across the agency. Yes, of course, because those who come in first, uh, we hope will become uh, upper level uh, members of, of your agency. Uh, and Director McRae for CFPB. What is your practice yeah. in terms of diverse hiring panels? 
So we recommend the use of diverse hiring panels to all for selections. Um, we also include for some positions that require subject matter expertise, we have subject matter expert panels. And for those, the applicant is really blinded to them. So they know nothing personally about the person other than the information related to their skill set. In addition to that, we include, as I mentioned earlier, unconscious bias training and we use structured interviews as well. Of course, it's one thing to recommend it. It's another to be very intentional. Uh, and I'm talking about uh, that the panelists, uh, not the applicant would be blinded, but the, the panelists should be diverse. So uh, I, I would hope that CFPB uh, would be very intentional upon that. Uh, and with that, Madam Chairman, I thank you for the time and I yield back. Thank you very much. The chair now recognizes the distinguished woman from Texas, Congresswoman Garcia for five minutes for questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, thank you so much for putting attention to this very important matter. And, you know, it may be that, that I've, it's because I've only been here a year and a half, uh, almost going out on my, the end of my first term. Um, and maybe I didn't hear where we were, were to figure out what progress we've made to today. Uh, but unlike some of my colleagues, I'm not sensing that we're making a lot of progress here. Uh, and to hear, uh, not just in this panel, but even from panel one, excuses like, well, they don't understand what they're supposed to be doing, or, well, they're confused, or this. It's like, y'all, it's been 10 years, and this is not a new ballgame in town. I mean, this is just about doing the right thing. Uh, so, Ms. Gibbs, I wanted to start with you. You mentioned uh, uh, the, the the number of advisory committees uh, that you all have put, put together at APC. I know that the Asset Management Advisory Committee has a dear friend of mine, I'm from Houston, uh, uh, Gilbert Garcia is on one of those. And while I'm very happy for Gilbert, I'm not happy that when you look at all the other committees and the number of members on the committee, and I think that uh, Chairman Waters and uh, Chairwoman Beatty sent a letter back in January that said, uh, that of the 79 advisory committee members, um, zero, only only uh, three of them were black, zero were Latina, and only one was a black woman. I mean, certainly the, in 2020, we could do better than that. So did your office have a role in that, in letting, uh, giving names to the, to the uh, chairman and in developing the committees and developing this membership? So the, uh, thank you for that question. So the office of I mean, my office is actively involved in in most of. Now I can say that we're actively involved in all of the committees. Uh, so we do thank you for the letter that came in. Informing the committees and naming the names. Said so, so that. Sorry, I didn't understand. Were you involved in the formation of the committees and? naming the people to serve on the committee? Uh, I am involved in making recommendations to some of the committees, but not to how the structure, how they are formulated. Right. So don't you think that we can, we can do better? Uh, uh, yes, we can do better with the representation. And Omwe is actively involved with the committees in terms of developing a slate. So just like we work with workforce diversity, uh, it's developing a pipeline. Who would want to serve on these committees? Who are they? What's their expertise? And that's what ARMWI is actively involved in. Uh, we also made a decision to select, bring on board uh, a, a good colleague, Robert Marchman, who is now the chair of the committee for the Investor Advisory Committee. Uh, so we've taken a number of steps uh, this year in particular to make sure that ONWI is embedded into actively the selection and the topics uh, of these uh, advisory committees. So are you committed to making sure that those committee uh, assignments are more reflective of, of uh, the population in our country? Absolutely. So when can we expect to see some new, new faces at the table? Uh, I believe when vacancies occur, uh, usually there's a set number. And so when vacancy occur, uh, we're hopeful. That's what I would say is, is that we're hopeful. I believe selections have been made positively in terms of African-Americans for two of the subcommittees already. And that's the Small Business Advocate Advisory Committee and the Investor Advisory Committee. 
Uh, at the time, uh, I'm not sure that we are currently, doing, I'm not sure about vacancies on AMAC, the Asset Management Advisory Committee, but we are working with them if vacancies do come up, that we have a slate of African Americans in particular um, that may be interested in serving on the committee. Well, as a Latina, I would also encourage you to uh, recruit and, and name a, a Latina. Obviously, you know, women at the table also makes a difference, and they need to be women of color in addition to to other women. So I appreciate That's that. Right. Quickly, I want to go to Ms. McGray. Uh, I know you mentioned, um, I, I know my colleague, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, asked about fraud, and I particularly wanted to ask about what you all are doing in terms of outreach for fraud for uh, perpetrated against people with language barriers or with seniors? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we actually have been recently focused, particularly during the time of the pandemic, on reaching out to people who have um, limited English proficiency. And going through my notes, I actually have some notes here that I wanted to make sure I got that information correct. Um, but I know that we did a symposium, uh, not a symposium, but a meeting, a, stake, a shareholder meeting to really engage with people to find out. We're working to make sure that people are getting access to the information and also what additional information is is needed and what kinds of languages. Let's see. Um, and just, I'm just looking at my notes for a second. So, um, well, if you could just send that to the committee in writing, I think that would be appropriate, uh, Madam Chair, and also uh, what outreach and what you're doing with regard to seniors. I know that I got initially, even after that first stimulus check, a lot of calls from uh, people in my district uh, that were being told that they had, to, they had to go through consultants to get their stimulus. Mm -hmm. yes. And we all knew that was bullcorn. Okay. Uh, but that's kind of Thank you so much. So, uh, so, I, mean, I can have the, the answer to both those questions. I appreciate it. Yeah, so I'd be happy Thank to provide the that. General, the general lady's time is up. Yes, ma'am, I expired. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. The chair now recognizes the distinguished gentle lady from New York, Congresswoman Maloney. Congresswoman Maloney, are you seated? I need to. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Chairman Beatty, thank you for allowing me to participate and for this very important hearing. I regret it took us a while to figure out how to get in here. This is an issue that is deeply personal to me. Uh, back in uh, 2015, I asked CGA. GAO to look at the gender makeup of corporate boards. And despite the fact that women make up 47% of the workforce, at that time they held only 16% of the board seats at S&P 500. Today it's 21%, it's still very, very low. The most startling finding in this report was how long they projected it would take to achieve gender parity on corporate boards. And GAO found that even if we assume that equal proportions of women and men started joining boards, starting right now, it would take more than 40 years for there to be an equal number of women and men on corporate boards. And we're here today to make sure that all of you as directors of the Office of Minority and Women Inclusion are holding your mission to ensuring diversity and inclusion if we ever hope to see real change in private sector firms, we must make sure that our financial regulators are taking this seriously and doing everything possible to ensure they don't find themselves uh, uh, digging out of the same hole. Uh, the GAO report that was released today, uh, for, and I wanna ask this of Mrs. Uh, Levine from the Office of Minority and Women uh, Initiatives, the director at FHFA. The GAO report was released today showing that Fannie and Freddie have failed to increase the number of women and minorities in their workforce. In 2018, uh, women employees uh, represented 45% at Fannie and 46% at Freddie, compared to 58% across firms in the private sector. 
And to make matters worse, the report showed the share of female employees at both GSEs declined from 2011 to 2018. So my question is, how are you holding managers accountable for implementation of your diversity and inclusion policies to promote the hiring of more women and minorities in your workforce? Uh, for example, does your agency utilize performance metrics, pay incentives, or other metrics to increase accountability for your management teams? Ms. Levine. Thank you. Our regulated entities, Fannie Mae and, and, and Freddie Mac, are, are included as well as the federal home loan banks, are subject to the Housing and Economic Recovery Act, which means they have an affirmative statutory obligation to promote diversity and ensure inclusion. That also gives FHFA very specific authority to examine those regulated entities for diversity and inclusion. And so in, in 2016, FHFA developed a diversity and inclusion examination program, which we implemented in 2017. And we're just about uh, finishing up the fourth year of that examination. In addition to that, we amended our minority and women inclusion regulation to require that each regulated entity develop a strategic plan for diversity and inclusion. And we do examine them uh, to ensure that they are, in fact, reaching the goals and objectives that they have set forth in their uh, three-year strategic plan. And that is on an annual basis. Well, uh, clearly they haven't been effective and more work needs to be done. It is key for the GSEs to recruit more women and minorities in these lower level positions as they are then better positioned, uh, just get them through the door to be promoted and considered for future senior management positions uh, like board membership. Um, I, I, I wanna know, do you reach out and get private entities to uh, try to find uh, diverse people? Do you get people to reach out and encourage people to apply? Do you take that uh, proactive step uh, with uh, hiring firms to help or uh, reaching out um, strategically to make sure you have more minorities and women in the workplace? Are you speaking about FHFA itself or are you referring to our regulated entities? I'm not quite sure. I'm talking about getting people to apply in the first place. You know, it's hard to hire women and minorities if they're not hiring for the job, if they're not applying for the job. So are, do you have outreach to make sure that more women and minorities are hired in the first place so that they're in the, they're in the queue? So when an opening comes up, they can be promoted. Absolutely. Um, our diverse workforce is 43.9%. Uh, so I'm, I'm not quite sure what you're referring to in, in terms of not uh, being very diverse. Um, well, it is diverse, but we would like to get it uh, to 50% at least, you know. So, um, but anyway, moving along, uh, as a result of that uh, GAO report, I uh, introduced the Diversity and Corporate Leadership Act. And my bill will require public companies to report the gender, racial, and ethnic composition of their boards um, and their annual proxy statements. And I'd like to ask this to Ms. Gibbs uh, um, from the SEC. Ms. Foreman, your, your time is up. Can we get a okay. short answer? Well, I'll, I'll submit it and write it to you, Madam Chair. Thank you for this very important hearing. And we need to work together to get those numbers up. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Let me now say thank you to all of our witnesses for your testimony. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for their response. I asked our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able to. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit extraneous materials to the chair for inclusion in the record. I remind members to submit written questions and materials for the record to the email address provided to your staff. The hearing is now adjourned.